Uh, I want to welcome the folks here in uh, Kaufman Union and those of you at our host sites around the state. Um, this is our third uh, Lessons from the Field series on autism. Uh, my name is Joel Hetler. I'm the director for the Center for Excellence in Children's Mental Health and your host for the day. Uh, the Center for Excellence is part of the Children, Youth, and Family Consortium at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we're pleased that uh, our whole autism series has had such a positive response uh, all around the state. And uh, we want to thank our co-sponsors um, who have been listed on the slides. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without their assistance, both financially and in terms of uh, organization, helping us contact speakers and so on. It's really made a huge difference. Um, today we're uh, presenting live um, on the university campus and we are also uh, video streaming to 38 sites uh, around the rest of the state. Uh, and uh, we think it's a privilege to be able to include those of you uh, in the rest of the state in this uh, conference. Uh, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, you each should have a folder and in your folder you'll find a schedule, uh, the bios for each of the presenters, uh, announcements about the upcoming and last workshop for the year on May 13th, and PowerPoint presenters from PowerPoint hand, handouts from our presenters. Uh, there also should be an evalu evaluation form uh, for those of you who are here uh, in the metro area. For those of you in greater Minnesota, uh, we would please request that you fill out your evaluation online at the web link that's provided in your schedule. Um, certificates of attendance will be available as you leave uh, with special uh, arrangements for school administrators, uh, school administrator certificates for those of you in attendance here can be picked up at the table outside. For those of you in greater Minnesota, uh, if you give your name, note on your name on the registration uh, sheet that you need a school administration certificate and we will send that to you. A uh, couple of other housekeeping items. Uh, those of you in the greater Minnesota host sites, when you have questions that you would like uh, to uh, our presenters to respond to uh, later on in the presentation, uh, please email those to us at cmhdata, cmhdata at umn.edu. Um, and host site coordinators, please be sure, you probably heard me say this before, that your, your uh, sites remain on mute at all times. Um, for those of you physically present here, restrooms um, are outside the auditorium and to your right as you are exiting. Um, and please uh, be sure that you turn off your cell phones uh, or put them on mute. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rondi Hegerman. Uh, Dr. Hegerman is a professor of pediatrics and endowed chair of Fragile X Research at the University of California Davis School of Medicine. And she also serves as the medical director for an organization I've always been interested in because they have such a cool name. It's the Mind Institute. Uh, which now I understand stands for Medical Investigation of Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Uh, Dr. Hagerman has a strong clinical and research interest in autism and has conducted research examining the association between autism and Fragile X Syndrome. Uh, she's an internationally recognized expert with more than 20 years of experience in the field of neurodevelopmental disorders. And as uh, as I was walking her over uh, to the theater this morning, I got my first lesson about Fragile X and was uh, surprised and excited to learn that it's a common 
but detectable and treatable disorder um, that um, many of us may have missed. And so I think we're in for some really important and very practical information today. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Rondi Hagerman. Uh, it is just nice to be here with sunshine. <laughs> I'm in California and um, uh, the Mind Institute, which is actually pictured here, let me get it on the presentation thing. Here's the Mind Institute, and uh, I actually came here in 2000 after spending 20 years at University of Colorado. Um, it was nice to come back to California because I was born and raised in Berkeley. Um, and it was also very nice to come back to a place that had an old whole institute uh, focused on neurodevelopmental disorders, because at University of um, Colorado, you know, we were the kind of money losing part of uh, the medical center and relegated to an old uh, rehab location. And in fact, uh, one of my fellows had her office uh, in the old hot tub room toilet area. So, you know, going from uh, those digs to, um, to a beautiful new institute that when you walk in the front door, it was designed by uh, uh, families that had children with autism and they wanted families to feel a sense of hope as they walked through the door. So it is actually a beautiful institute um, and it's been a joy to be there since uh, 2000. Well, I want to get you excited today about the association between Fragile X and autism. I'm going to talk about a whole range of disorders related to the Fragile X gene that's on the bottom end of the X chromosome. I'm going to talk about uh, multimodality interventions, but I'm also going to talk about the diagnostic process, which needs to really have multiple professionals involved. Um, Oftentimes, a therapist who has worked with a, uh, a child with fragile X because of the very characteristic phenotype of poor eye contact and hand flapping, sometimes hand biting, anxiety, and hyperarousal, will recognize it when they see it again and will recommend to the family that uh, this kid should be tested for fragile X because of the similarities in the behavioral phenotype. And sometimes the physician may not have even heard of Fragile X. We oftentimes hear that. Or Fragile X associated disorders, which we'll be talking more about. In fact, I've talked to several families here today that have taken their children or adult individuals to multiple professionals and nobody tested them for Fragile X. So we want to change that here. Um, I'm going to start out with some general comments about autism. Uh, and everybody's seen the DSM-4 diagnostic criteria for autism, but I want to point out that autism is a behavioral diagnosis. It's not a medical etiological diagnosis. So it's like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. There's many, many causes of this behavioral phenotype. And so you have to look for the causes. Same with autism. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the diagnostic workup because everybody's very familiar with the diagnosis of autism. But sometimes this diagnosis is made often by a psychologist who's doing standardized testing to make the diagnosis. And uh, Kathy Lord and other individuals have made it uh, much easier with standardized testing to make the diagnosis, but you have to work uh, with the medical people, uh, pediatrics, psychiatry, neurology, who are ordering the blood workup. You know, you have to do blood tests to find out about the uh, specific cause of their autism. There's not a single explanation for autism. It's a behavioral construct. You know, we're able to figure out the cause now in about 20 to 30, in some papers, even 40% of the causes of autism. So you have to look for that. This is definitely uh, a multi-professional endeavor. Um, and I'm going to just talk about that workup. Um, I think that the advances in molecular biology and neurobiology 
and also in brain imaging have really taught us a lot about what is going wrong from a variety of different known etiologies. And of course, we're always investigating you know, whether there uh, can be additional environmental toxins that could be adding to a genetic vulnerability to autism. And I think that research is actually in its infancy and will definitely be expanding. And we're always interested in how to improve educational and therapeutic endeavors for individuals with autism. And starting early uh, is absolutely essential. But what we've learned is that there are multiple genetic loci. Um, uh, some of the newer studies um, uh, with copy number variants are showing us uh, that there are abnormalities in different parts of the genome and maybe additive uh, genetic vulnerabilities that can lead to autism. Uh, that there can be a very broad spectrum. I mean, on a regular basis, I see kids that are gifted with autism. I see kids that are severely retarded with autism. I see kids with multiple, you know, physical anomalies with autism and kids that look absolutely normal with autism. So it comes in all different varieties. Um, some of the commonalities, uh, particularly with functional MRI studies show abnormal processing and abnormal connectivity in different parts of the brain. In fact, I just read a paper that came out in PLOS um, this week that talked about white matter abnormalities in 48% of individuals with idiopathic autism. So even the neuroimaging is changing, uh, looking at abnormalities in, in white matter that uh, when you use the right kind of T1, T2, and flare imaging that you can demonstrate some of these abnormalities um, that many studies have not seen before. Uh, we do know that there are a variety of genes uh, that control the protein expression at the synapse where two nerve cells come together. And if there's mutations in any one of these genes, it can cause abnormalities in synaptic connectivity. And um, uh, most of these genes, when mutated, can cause an autism-like phenotype. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So anything that interferes with synaptic plasticity, you know, could be related to autism. We also know that uh, GABA systems in the brain, these are inhibitory systems, and glutamate systems, stimulatory systems, sometimes these systems can come, uh, can develop an imbalance and there's a variety of genetic mutations that can cause gamma and glutamate abnormalities in the brain. And many of these gene mutations are associated with autism. Um, so many of these neuromodulatory functions of GABA, glutamate systems, synaptic plasticity, et cetera, um, can affect how different parts of the brain connect. And that interference in connectivity uh, can lead to different forms of autism. Uh, so some of the themes are going to be synaptic plasticity abnormalities, excitation and inhibition abnormalities, connectivity problems, and neuromodulation problems. All of these problems can be associated with autism. We do know about um, structures that seem to be more involved in autism uh, than other structures, uh, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, this red area here, really important for the processing of emotional information, eye contact, that sort of thing. The somatosensory cortex, and many of these individuals can under or overreact to various types of sensory stimuli. And the insula that helps to integrate all this information and connect to the emotional or the limbic system of the brain. These are areas that are often dysfunctional. There's been some new research about neuroinflammation in autism, and people are very interested in autoimmune problems that could relate uh, to autism, and we will be touching on that, uh, particularly because there can be autoimmune problems uh, related to um, uh, Fragile X. Altered brain serotonin levels, and serotonin is a very important neurotransmitter both for the limbic system 
uh, the amygdala, hippocampus, also throughout the frontal regions of the brain. Um, and there's evidence that there can be low levels of serotonin early on in childhood in these regions of the brain. And, and serotonin is kind of trophic, uh, helps to stimulate uh, uh, um, neuronal uh, connectivity and, and growth. And so um, there's a lot of research going on now about starting... Uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, very early on in autism to stimulate language, uh, decrease obsessive compulsive behavior, and uh, also stimulate uh, social interactions. Um, so that research is pretty exciting too. Um, this is from a slide uh, by Belmonte and Bergeron talking about many pathways that lead to autism. Some of the things that I've been talking about, we're going to talk a lot about fMR1 gene dysfunction, uh, the mGluR5 system, and this uh, postsynaptic density protein that's important for synaptic plasticity. MECP2 is the gene that is mutated in Rett syndrome, which can cause a, um, an autistic-like uh, phenotype. Um, these are uh, tuber sclerosis genes, neurofibromatosis, P10 is a gene that regulates growth, and when it's mutated, it can cause very large heads that can be seen in a significant uh, number in one study by Merlin Butler in 18% of individuals with autism with big heads. Um, chromosome 15 uh, duplications can be associated with autism. Neuroligin mutations um, and also neurorexin mutations, which are associated with synaptogenesis, the connecting of synapses I talked about. These can also cause autism. So there is a variety of structural changes that can happen in the brain related to all of these different mutations, and this can lead to the susceptibility of autism spectrum disorders. Um, there are whole lists of genes when mutated which can cause autism. This is just one of these lists here, um, but the list has grown over the years and some very exciting uh, new genes have come out lately. So for the clinician that is doing the blood work and the workup of individuals with autism, and again, this may be after the psychologist um, has made the diagnosis with um, standardized, uh, uh, quantitative uh, new measures like the ADOS, the ADI, um, and, and other uh, measures. I, I think that um, behavioral evaluation of autism is really important, but just as important, I think, is the medical workup for autism. Um, and Schaefer and Lutz have published papers, even more recent papers, that have demonstrated in this particular paper 41% of the individuals with autism, they were able to find a specific genetic disorder. So there are not only high-resolution chromosome testing with FISH studies and, of course, Fragile X DNA testing, which we'll talk more about, metabolic studies. You can also do gene sequences. But actually, this number may be even more enhanced with these new, what we call CGH arrays. These are studies. Um, this is, stands for comparative genomic hybridization. We now have probes for the whole genome. And these probes are getting more and more and more detailed. So now, really, the workup of autism, um, uh, we think that CGH arrays are medically indicated because they can pick up subtle deletions, subtle duplications, uh, variations in different parts of the genome. And just with this test alone, um, it can uh, detect, you know, somewhere between uh, 20 to 30 percent of patients with autism that can have a genetic abnormality. So there are several centers uh, that have great expertise in doing CGH arrays. Baylor is one of the centers um, that we routinely send to, but there are a lot of private labs that are now uh, doing CGH arrays for making the diagnosis of autism uh, or looking at the genetic cause of autism. Again, the diagnosis is made behaviorally, uh, 
Um, but the genetic workup is absolutely essential. Um, so I want to propose that Fragile X is really a great model for autism because um, many children with Fragile X have full autism by ADOS, ADI, diagnosis about 30%. And I, you know, I apologize. Whenever I give a lecture and they want the slides two weeks ahead of time, I'm usually traveling or giving another lecture, so I don't put enough time into you know, what I send two weeks ahead, and really most of the time happens the night before in fine-tuning the lecture. Um, and I gave a lecture yesterday, and I got all kinds of input about what I should talk about today. So I apologize. Your handout is, you know, what I was thinking about two weeks ago, and things dynamically change, but usually for the better. So. Um, you have most of my slides, but not all. Or they might be out of order, and so I apologize for that, too. But believe me, what I put together last night is much better than what I put together two weeks ago. Uh, so I think Fragile X is a great model for autism. 30% of children with Fragile X syndrome have full autism. Another 20 to 30% have PDD-NOS or are on the autism spectrum. So really, we're talking about 50% plus that um, have uh, an autism spectrum disorder. And then the ones that don't meet full criteria for autism or even PDDN, NOS, oftentimes have poor eye contact, hand flapping, and a lot of autistic-like features, even though they might be very interested in social interaction. So um, autism is really very tightly uh, interrelated. Uh, fragile X, I think, is the most common genetic cause of autism. But if you take 100 children diagnosed with idiopathic autism and do Fragile X DNA testing on all of them, you will find anywhere from 2 to 6% that come out with a Fragile X mutation. And I'll talk more about the full mutation and the pre-mutation. Both disorders, Fragile X and autism, have big heads, rapid brain, brain growth early in childhood, and Fragile X with autism has a bigger head than Fragile X without autism. Uh, Fragile X has problems with hyperarousal and anxiety, as I will show you. And I think a subgroup of idiopathic autism can also have very similar problems. The reason it's very important to sort out the subgroups of idiopathic autism that have a similar phenotype to Fragile X is because there is now targeted treatments for Fragile X that reverse the neurobiological abnormalities. So I think Fragile X is leading the way in terms of new targeted treatments that will reverse the mental retardation and autism. And some of these treatments, because of the molecular overlap with other causes of autism, uh, some of these new treatments that I'm going to talk to you about today, I think will work for idiopathic autism that doesn't have the Fragile X mutation but has similar neurobiological pathways. So I apologize for all of the neurobiology you're going to hear about today. But for me, this is really an exciting time. And I have been in this field for actually far more than 20 years. And this is the most exciting year. And I'll you know, hope to generate some of that excitement to you. Um, so for all those kids out there that didn't want to be tested for any genetic thing that could be causing their autism, I think the tables will be turned now. Because if there's a targeted treatment that can reverse the abnormalities, they want to be on the bandwagon to get the treatment. So um, I think this will really create an upswing in how many individuals get genetically tested. Uh, both disorders have problems with um, eye contact. Uh, Fragile X patients tend to actively avoid eye contact. It actually hyperarouses direct eye contact, uh, overactivates the amygdala, this emotional area in the brain that's really important for coordinating eye contact. And in other causes of autism, that can be the case too. We'll talk a little bit about the AMPA receptors. Um, which when there's a lot more AMPA receptors, there's strengthened synaptic connections. And those with Fragile X and autism together really have a lower IQ than Fragile X alone. Uh, the level of the amount of Fragile X protein does not really correlate with whether they have autism or not once you control for the IQ. 
So with Fragile X and autism together, there seems to be an additive effect or an additive degree of dysfunction. Now, FMRP, the protein that is made by the Fragile X gene, is one of these mother proteins that controls a lot of other things. It actually hooks up to messenger RNAs from many other genes, and it controls how those messages, those RNA messages, gets converted into proteins. So it is kind of a control protein for many other systems in the, in the central nervous system, which we'll talk about more today. I wanted to point out, this is some data that we published last year on the ADOS. This is on the old scoring of the ADOS. Each one of these triangles here represents an individual patient with Fragile X syndrome. And this is the communication and social uh, uh, total score here. And um, with this module, there's a cutoff for autism here. So you can see it's really a continuum how significantly affected individuals with Fragile X are in the communication and social aspects. And um, this is the repetitive behaviors are pretty similar whether they have autism or not. Um, but with the new scoring um, that came out where the repetitive and perseverative behaviors are pushed into um, the diagnostic criteria, it actually shifted about an additional 30% of individuals with Fragile X from uh, on non-autism spectrum into the autism spectrum. <laughs> Occasional individuals shifted out, but more, many more shifted in now that the repetitive and perseverative behaviors are taken in. I also want to point out that individuals with Fragile X overreact to sensory stimuli. And that's really important for you teachers in the audience. Um, here is a guy, an adult actually with Fragile X, in the photography studio that has given me some nonverbal signals that he has just about had it with the number of pictures I'm taking of him. So he's getting overstimulated here. And you know, you as a teacher, you don't want to start, you know, raising your voice to him when you see this nonverbal signal because you will likely be hit, okay? You want to launch into some calming techniques. And, and basically, uh, Lucy Miller, who is a great um, uh, 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 OT uh, person in Denver, she uh, did some of the uh, early uh, electrodermal responses comparing normals with Fragile X. And these represent the sweat responses, which are sympathetic responses, autonomic, sympathetic responses to sensory stimuli. And the sensory stimuli are these lines here. So whether it's visual, auditory, tactile, it doesn't make any difference. If you give them repetitive stimuli, normal individuals habituate to the stimuli over time, but Fragile X patients do not. In fact, they have enhanced amplitude, an enhanced number of responses, and they don't habituate. So you have got to take into consideration what is going on in the autonomic system of that child with Fragile X. Now, this can happen, I think, in some other uh, causes of autism, too. But this is why sensory integration techniques are so important for calming down sensory hyperarousal. Because if they're hyperaroused, and this oftentimes goes along with anxiety, whenever the sympathetic system really puts out, you get a lot of anxiety, and learning just goes down the tubes. And so we do a lot from the medical perspective about treating anxiety, like with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you know, Prozac, Zoloft, a lot of those medications can be very important. Mood stabilizers can be very important. Uh, we really try to avoid major outbursts uh, in the classroom. We try to really help them not have aggressive episodes in the classroom. But this really does relate to their sensory hyperarousal, uh, which is a big problem. I was at a uh, Cold Spring Harbor Conference um, last week uh, where an individual was talking to me about certain uh, receptors um, 
that uh, are modulated, these auditory receptors are modulated by the fMR1 protein. So in Fragile X, the fMRP or the Fragile X protein is missing. So they can't modulate these auditory receptors and they get the same response whether a sound is at 60 hertz or 600 hertz, okay? It is overwhelming. So some of the Fragile X kids that you see that are like this when an alarm goes off in school, it's because they can't down modulate these auditory receptors and they just, you know, overreact, um, sometimes even to quieter sounds. So kids with Fragile X are usually hyperactive, particularly the boys, but also many girls with Fragile X. Some of the physical features can include ear cupping, as you see here, but there's a lot of kids with Fragile X that don't have the ear cupping. This little girl gets into a lot of trouble. She lives in Australia. Um, but all of these features, you know, um, uh, kids with Fragile X tend to do power salutes. You know, when my kids were babies and in their high chair, and when they got upset, they'd do a, I called it a power salute, you know, because, uh, you know, this is from the 1970s and 1980s. And I, you know, my kids with power salutes, you know, that is part of normal development, but it kind of goes away after two or three years of age. Well, uh, you know, I see power salutes from individuals with Fragile X at all ages, even into adulthood. Um, hand flapping, seen in the majority, hand biting, you know, um, poor eye contact. Here are two brothers. This one has full autism, and this one doesn't meet criteria for autism, but as you can see, he's very eye avoidant. So these kinds of problems are very common, perseverative speech and behavior in almost all routines, um, the, and tactile defensiveness, overreacting to uh, tactile, you know, direct touch, um, this is a problem. So the features of Fragile X, they're very hyperactive, impulsive, short attention span. Those individuals with Fragile X who have a normal IQ, and many girls with the full mutation have a normal IQ, 25%, uh, you know, of girls with a, a full mutation of Fragile X are intellectually impaired, but the majority of uh, girls with the full mutation are in the borderline range, and then we see, you know, 30% or so of girls with the full mutation that are in the normal IQ range, but often have executive function, uh, problems with planning, inhibition, tangential speech, perseveration. They overreact to stimuli, not only in the electrodermal response, but they have an enhanced cortisol release to stress. And actually, we're seeing the same things in carriers, okay? So oftentimes, moms, you know, who have, who are carriers of Fragile X with a premutation, can also experience a lot of anxiety and enhanced stress. Now, we used to think this was just from raising kids with Fragile X, <laughs> which is enough to cause a lot of stress, but um, they physiologically have an enhanced uh, stress response. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other uh, difficulties that can occur in the premutation in a minute, but anxiety is real common in both premutation and full mutation individuals. So this anxiety and autonomic hyper-responsiveness, uh, uh, you know, kind of go together. And we've actually seen a nice correlation between anxiety measures and the severity of the autism. Now, mood instability is another problem. This can be a problem for carriers, can be a problem for normal IQ, full mutation individuals, and a problem for even those with intellectual impairment with the full mutation. And oftentimes, these individuals can go to mental health centers and, um, you know, get diagnosed with bipolar disorder or episodic discontrol or whatever, and usually never tested for Fragile X. So I want to encourage mental health centers to also you know, send the person to the lab, particularly if there's a family history of autism or intellectual impairment or some of these other problems that I'm going to be talking about to see if this person um, has uh, a Fragile X mutation, pre or full. 
So this little girl, and I'm sorry I don't have the video. Um, my computer was stolen in Guatemala, so there went the video. Um, but um, she presented just with tantrum behavior all day long, but you don't want to see a, a video of someone just tantruming. It's just overwhelming. Um, so an anxiety is a real key feature. We focus on it more with females because they sometimes present with selective mutism. Often the aggression can be related to anxiety. Uh, social avoidance can be related to the anxiety. And this has to do with uh, um, sympathetic, and I see there's a misspelling here, hyperarousal. We're also going to talk about some of the GABA underactivity in Fragile X. Uh, many GABA genes are underactive. Amygdala overactivity and overconnectivity is related to this. So um, this video should work. This is an adult guy with Fragile X, and I'm sorry we don't have the audio, but the audio isn't much because the audio is just me talking. And this guy has selective mutism. As you can see, He's nodding, and I'm asking him questions. I'm getting up there pretty close because I can't get him to respond. Um, he has the full mutation for Fragile X, presented with selective mutism. Uh, so we typically see this more in girls, um, but it's also something um, that we're seeing uh, more frequently in boys now, too. But usually younger Fragile X kids are so hyperreactive, or hyperactive, actually, that um, oftentimes uh, that kind of overwhelms selective mutism, whereas girls with the full mutation are often shy, socially anxious, and you see much more frequent, obvious selective mutism. So Fragile X occurs in all racial, all ethnic groups, uh, all ages. Typically, you, you know, if you have a really good uh, early intervention program, Fragile X is diagnosed, um, you know, between two and three years of age. I just don't know why it's not. There we go. Changing here. Uh, but other places, I mean, we've seen kids not diagnosed until five or six or 11 or, you know, sometimes a high-functioning guy who, you know, went through mental health centers um, and got diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome or autism spectrum. Nobody did DNA testing, may not be diagnosed until adulthood. So um, it can happen at all ages. Other features that we see, uh, strabismus in about 20%, and this is real subtle. We diagnosed him with Fragile X when he came and saw us at age seven, and already uh, he has a very slight uh, esotropia here, and so I sent him to the ophthalmologist, and he already had amblyopia. So it's important that these kids get um, an ophthalmological or optometric evaluation um, definitely before four years of age, if not sooner. They oftentimes can have double-jointed thumbs, hyperextensible finger joints, and big testicles is part of the um, phenotype of Fragile X. But the testicle typically doesn't become big, and the top three lines here are Fragile X testicles compared to the bottom three lines are normal um, uh, range testicles. As you see, um, children develop larger testicles after age eight or nine. So you don't see big testicles typically in the young kids, but they really get to two to three times normal size um, in the early part of puberty, stabilized by the end of puberty. So pediatricians are measuring testicles, but psychiatrists, not, never. <laughs> not, not going to do that. <laughs> You know, I encourage measuring testicles, but uh, I don't know. It falls on deaf ears. But um, even actually, even some uh, pre-mutation carriers, particularly in the upper end of the pre-mutation range, can have slightly large testicles. And it's actually a biomarker for really how low your FMRP is. Um, now, individuals that have a double hit that is, Fragile X and something else, are much more likely to have autism. So here we have a family of four kids here, and this little boy was born with Down syndrome. But then this boy here is a normal IQ, high-functioning boy who was very hyperactive and mood unstable and hand-flapped. 
So somebody did Fragile X testing on him, and he was diagnosed as Fragile X syndrome, you know, when he was five or six. And so once he has a full mutation, we know that the mother is always the carrier in someone that has a full mutation. Um, if someone has a pre-mutation uh, and it's a girl, the pre-mutation could have come from her father. But it only passes to a full mutation when it is passed on by the mother. So that, that means the mother's a carrier. She has two X chromosomes. Each child could either get one X or the other. And so we tested everybody, and guess what? This little girl who had shyness, social anxiety, and math problems in school, but normal IQ, turned out to have the full mutation. And guess what? This little boy with Down syndrome and really bad autism and completely nonverbal as he, as he uh, got older turned out to have Down syndrome and Fragile X. And that's a rough combo uh, and almost always leads to uh, autism. But individuals with birth trauma, cerebral palsy and fragile X, or seizures, which can occur sometimes in over 20% of the males, and this gentleman here with fragile X and autism and seizures, you can see these spike wave discharges on his EEG. He had a vagal nerve stimulator, and actually that helped his autism, helped his seizures and helped his fragile X. So this is a study that we published um, uh, just showing that those with fragile X plus autism have a much higher rate of uh, seizures and combined uh, additional medical problems than those with fragile X without autism. Um, this is a really interesting uh, example of molecular overlap. So here are two Fragile X brothers. This one has what we call the Prater Willi phenotype of Fragile X syndrome. So he has obesity and overeating and lack of satiation after a meal, actually small genitalia, delayed puberty. And these are a lot of features of Prater Willi syndrome related to a deletion on chromosome 15. But he doesn't have that deletion. He has Fragile X syndrome. And uh, FMRP is right here. And it interacts with another protein called CFIPS. That stands for cytoplasmic interacting FMR1 protein. So it impacts a lot of other areas. It impacts the actin um, uh, fibers in, in the neuron. Um, it interacts with uh, actually RAC and Rho, which are very important for synaptic plasticity and growth of the synaptic connections. And when CFIP was found, this is a, a protein that comes from a gene that's on chromosome 15 in the Prader-Willi region. When CFIP was uh, identified to come from that 15Q region, we measured CFIP expression and protein levels in patients with the Prater Willi phenotype of Fragile X, and it was found to be very low. Okay? So, in other individuals with Fragile X syndrome, CFIP is very high because FMRP controls CFIP expression. So, when FMRP is not there, the inhibition of that expression is relieved and CFIP is upregulated. That's in regular Fragile X syndrome, but it is dramatically downregulated in those that have the Prater Willi phenotype. We don't know why it's downregulated. Less than 10% of Fragile X patients have this Prater Willi phenotype, but the interesting thing is, is if you have this Prater Willi phenotype, you are much more likely to have autism or autism spectrum disorder. So it's like an additive genetic effect. Here is chromosome 15. And for those of you that do research in autism, you know that this is a very hot region because when it's duplicated, um, it is uh, very likely to cause autism and a uh, very specific you know, kind of phenotype of autism. And here's CFIP right up here. There are other GABA receptors in this region and other very important genes. So there may be a variety of different reasons why there's more autism in this group. 
So um, recently, a mouse model with CFIP deleted was developed by uh, Joe Buxbaum, an autism genetic researcher, and he presented at the last human genetics meeting that this mouse has a lot of social deficits and uh, autism features. So that's not surprising to us because when we see CFIP downregulation in Fragile X with the Prader Willi phenotype, we see much more autism. So um, we, want, we definitely want to do more research in this area. We also are very interested in individuals with idiopathic autism that have obesity and hyperphagia. Hyperphagia means, you know, eating all the time. You know, some, sometimes all of us have a little bit of that. But, uh, but this is a lack of satiation after a meal, you know. Um, so CFIP definitely uh, is an important gene for appetite regulation, too. Um, so it's going to be interesting to understand how this is related to autism and whether CFIP downregulation can occur in other uh, idiopathic causes of autism. Um, I just want to show you a picture of the Fragile X gene. At the front end of the gene, there is a CGG repeat. You know, DNA is like a twisted ladder, and the rungs on the ladder have the nucleotides. So on one side of the ladder, there's a CGG, CGG repetitive sequence. Now, this gene has been very important for uh, evolution of human intellect um, and uh, probably in evolution. There turned out to be a greater number of CGG repeats because <clears throat> this can upregulate the expression of this gene. Uh, with the greater number of CGG repeats. And this gene is so important for synaptic plasticity that in the evolution of uh, human intelligence, this gene has been very important. But when the CGG repeat gets too big, like over 200 repeats, and this is the full mutation, um, it has a big problem uh, with uh, replication uh, and, the, and the body will methylate this gene or turn it off. And uh, this is an example here. These little orange balls on the backbone of this gene is a methylation process, a CH3 process that silences the gene so that it doesn't produce any message or very little message. And here's the messenger RNA that's produced by the gene. And the message, you know, if you remember your, you know, genetics from high school, the message is what goes out into the cytoplasm of the cell and gets translated into the protein. Okay? So the lack of message <clears throat> and the lack of protein is what causes Fragile X syndrome. Now I'm going to talk to you about what happens in the carrier state or the premutation state where there's 55 to 200 CGG repeats. Actually, compared to normals, this uh, premutation produces extra messenger RNA. It can produce anywhere from two to eight times normal levels of message. So it's actually just the opposite of Fragile X syndrome. Fragile X syndrome, no message, no protein. Fragile X premutation disorders, extra message, okay? Now, usually the protein is normal or close to normal, but there are certain conditions that occur, premature ovarian failure or primary ovarian insufficiency is where in, women can go into menopause uh, or a menopause-like state without menstruating before age 40. And the premutation is the most common genetic cause of this problem. And um, there's also what we call the Fragile X associated tremor ataxia syndrome or FAXTAS. And um, that's FXTAS. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this because the premutation is actually pretty common in the general population anywhere from 1 in 130 to 1 in 250 females in the general population has the premutation. And in males, it's anywhere from 1 in 250 to 1 in 800. 
So it's less common in the males, um, but definitely uh, there's a lot of people in your area here that have the premutation. Uh, it's more common than individuals with fragile X syndrome, which is about 1 in 2,500 to 1 in 3,600 in the general population. So um, these premutation associated disorders are, are common. Now, why do they have problems? And it's because the premutation or all of this excess messenger RNA causes dysregulation of some of the proteins in the cell. In the neuron, the cell with the premutation divides more rapidly. So we see lots of individuals with the premutation that are extra smart. Okay? But the neuron can die more easily with stress, okay, and with toxins, too. Um, so we're studying that, too. Um, and uh, we even see uh, particularly young boys with the premutation who can present with autism spectrum disorders, and I'll show you about that. So when we think about, this is looking at the whole CGG repeat range. Here's normal. Here's gray zone. And actually, in the gray zone between 45 and 55, this is a gray area of research because uh, NIH hasn't funded it yet. But we see um, problems with the gray zone. The messenger RNA is two times normal. The rate of premature ovarian failure is two times uh, the rate in the general population, and we're very interested in neurological problems and even autism spectrum disorders in the gray zone. But definitely, I've had enough difficulty in, in this field just convincing people that premutation carriers can have problems. Everybody thought I was nuts for years, but then when we discovered the fragile X associated tremory taxia syndrome or fax task, you know, when you have a hard neurological problem that people are really suffering from, uh, then you can't deny uh, these difficulties. So um, that is, is really clearly associated with the premutation along with uh, premature ovarian failure. And we think there's psychopathology and other difficulties that sometimes can occur. Um, that we'll talk more about. But then when you go into the full mutation, the level of messenger RNA goes down when there's complete methylation. Sometimes it can stay a little bit elevated when there's a lack of methylation or a mosaic pattern. Some individuals, I mean, individuals that can have some cells with the premutation and some cells with the full mutation. And then the level of the fragile X protein is normal for most individuals with the premutation, but it can go slightly down in the upper end of the premutation. And then it uh, basically disappears when you have a full mutation male, but it can stay at a higher level in a full mutation female. So these are the kinds of problems we see. So there's a whole spectrum of involvement, whether you're talking about fragile X syndrome, which means that this person has the full mutation, or fragile X associated disorders for all of these other problems that can be related to the premutation. And it was really the mothers who were talking to me about their kids with the full mutation. And here's two very high functioning kids with the full mutation. This boy presents with Asperger's syndrome and full mutation. This girl with ha who has a full mutation who has done very well, she actually has a gifted IQ, but auditory processing problems and anxiety problems related to her full mutation. And this mother who raised these two fragile X kids who have done very well, also got the gene from her father, this first gentleman who we diagnosed with uh, fax tasks, who was an electrician and developed an intention tremor, and this dramatically interfered with his job. Um, and then here's a woman that um, died just last year. She had 10 children, uh, several of them with the full mutation, many with the premutation premutation, and many, many grandchildren with Fragile X syndrome, uh, followed at Kaiser for many years. Um, she had years of fibromyalgia, years of anxiety, years of chronic pain and neuropathy, actually became addicted to pain medication because of the neuropathy in her legs, uh, swollen legs, as you can see here. 
Um, and then developed tremor and ataxia. As you can see, she's in a wheelchair here, and so eventually was diagnosed with FAXTAS. But we think that there is an association between the premutation and some autoimmune problems, including fibromyalgia and hypothyroidism, and I'll show you some of the data. Here's a mom. I don't know if you guys saw the Time Magazine article that came out in July, but this family was highlighted because this mom has two boys. One has fragile X syndrome, and it's this one who has slightly prominent ears. She herself has had um, ovarian problems and was diagnosed with POI recently, and her father has had very uh, severe fax tasks. So there's multiple individuals. Actually, I should show these three kids, all with the full mutation, none of them presented with mental retardation. This one with shyness, social anxiety. This one with a big head and hypotonia, who has normal IQ and some language delays a few years later. Um, and this boy, very severe hyperactivity, temper outbursts. He has 200 repeats right between the pre and the full mutation. Uh, even though his IQ is normal, uh, very significant problems with... Um, severe ADHD and mood instability and some paranoid ideation, so very interested psychiatric profile. Now, FMRP, as I mentioned, is this mother protein that binds with messages from many other genes, hauls these messages out to the synapse, and then it regulates the translation of these messages at the synapse. And um, I think understanding uh, that FMRP is this uh, really important regulatory protein that usually is inhibiting translation. So it's keeping things under control at the synapse, and only when the right kind of stimulation comes in does it de-repress the translation mechanism, and the right kind of stimuli comes in, and proteins are produced that strengthen the synaptic connection. So many other genes that we know are associated with autism are regulated by FMRP. Neuroligins, neurorexins, the ARC protein, MAP1 kinase, PSD95. MMP9, or this matrix metalloproteinase 9, which is going to be related to a new targeted treatment that I'm going to tell you about. CAM kinase, uh, many other proteins. It actually, the lack of FMRP downregulates P10. Uh, and it upregulates mTOR. Uh, and for those of you who are really good molecular biologists, um, which there's probably very few in this audience, but um, that is meaningful for you. Uh, so here's a really complicated picture I just got at the Banbury meeting from Jennifer Darnell, a great molecular biologist. And this is the synapse, you know, this is the presynaptic part of the synapse, and this is the postsynaptic part of the synapse. And all of these proteins are really important for building and strengthening the synapse. And so uh, she's done a lot of work uh, about what proteins bind and are regulated to FMRP, and all of the box proteins here are regulated by FMRP presynaptically, and these box proteins are all regulated to FMRP postsynaptically. You know, most of you who know about neuroligins and neurorexins would maybe be interested uh, in this aspect. But so we have a lot more to learn about what is controlled by FMRP. Now, um, we and others have reported about autism and premutation carriers. So in the past, when pediatricians or neurologists who order the DNA test and saw the premutation, you know, People used to think that the premutation was not associated um, with any clinical involvement, and so they would just ignore a premutation um, uh, finding. But um, individuals with the premutation can look very normal. This little girl, though, has lots of features of fragile X, hand flapping, hand biting, but lo and behold, she got the premutation from her dad, and she was diagnosed with autism years before she was diagnosed with the premutation. But she actually has lowered protein, as does this boy. Both of these individuals are intellectually impaired, but we've seen more recently a group of individuals with the premutation who have very high IQ, very high verbal IQ, who have very bright individuals who have more of an Asperger-like uh, phenotype and meet diagnostic criteria for Asperger's with high IQ. 
uh, related to the premutation. So we were very interested in how often this happens. You know, when you see a kid in clinic, that's a very skewed sample. And so we compared in this study that was published in 2006, boys that presented to our clinic as the proband found to have the premutation. Then we do cascade testing through the family. That means uh, cascade, you know, do fragile X DNA testing in other family members who are at risk to have the mutation. So we looked at the brothers who were the non-probands but found to have the premutation compared to the control brothers. So here's a boy that presented to our clinic um, uh, at age seven and six. The proband presented with autism and ADHD. He was found to have the premutation. His brother here was also tested and found to have the premutation, but he has clinical significant anxiety in ADHD. So ADHD, very common in the probands, of course, because they're skewed, because they come into clinic. But cascade testing, not probands, had a pretty good rate of ADHD com and different compared to their brothers. But autism spectrum disorder, 73% of the probands had an ASD, uh, four out of the 14 had full autism, seven out of the 14 had PDD-NOS. Compared to the non-probands, we found one with full autism, but typically the non-probands had more shyness, social anxiety, social deficits, the SCQ, which is a, another uh, faster checklist for social deficits, was significantly different than the normal brothers. So most of the time you get more subclinical or milder problems. Now we have looked at adults with the premutation in functional MRI studies, and these are adults who do not have neurological problems. And we find that the connectivity to the amygdala is problematic because the amygdala, or this emotional area of the brain, actually doesn't light up. Here's controls, and here's the young adult premutation group. The amygdala doesn't light up as it should to uh, fearful faces. Um, so there does seem to be some connectivity problem. You know, uh, sometimes we can see uh, older adults with the premutation that have social deficits or a little bit on the obsessive compulsive side. Um, women with the premutation, particularly if they have more than 100 repeats, have even higher rates of depression. Uh, we've seen that anxiety, uh, different types of psychopathology can, uh, particularly obsessive compulsive disorder, correlate with the level of messenger RNA. So, uh, and this is particularly true in males. Uh, as we see here, premutation females and premutation males with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and this correlated with the level of messenger RNA uh, in the males. Um, so again, individuals with the premutation can be very bright, uh, particularly in verbal areas. Um, they sometimes can have anxiety, be a little on the obsessive compulsive side, and we find, and this again may be skewed because um, you know we bring in a number of people, and of the individuals that we've seen with fax tasks, we've seen that 40% either have a master's degree, a PhD, or an MD, uh, or are lawyers, uh, you know, Fortune 500 company execs, and I think it's because this phenotype of having Good verbal abilities, being a little on the obsessive side and kind of driven, uh, you know, driven, you know, with a little OCD, gets you a long way in our society. Actually, gets you to get higher education. So we've seen many individuals with the premutation that are on faculty. You know, that's a good place to screen for the premutation. <laughs> On faculty, both at, you know, at uh, University of Colorado and at UC Davis. Um, so we've had to, because some people are so bright, we had to, for controls, we've had to get emeritus faculty just to match the bright IQ. Anyway, and I think this is because the premutation neuron replicates faster, and so I, that's part of why I think we see some with a higher IQ. But there are some individuals, uh, particularly at the upper end of the premutation, 
who may have not only high message but slightly lower protein. Isaac Pessa is a great neurobiologist associated with the Mind Institute, and he and Yu Sui Shen have looked at neuronal uh, uh, cultures with uh, premutation neurons. And what you can get, and these are individuals that have, um, I think these individuals have around 150 repeats, but we can see differences, uh, I'm sorry, this is 172 repeats. So we can see differences in the neuronal cell culture in terms of the branching uh, here, um, less branching. Um, the synapses, um, actually there's reduced uh, complexity, but the synaptic size um, is actually uh, increased. And let me show you this. The synapse is increased in size um, related to the controls. So we think that there, for some, there can be even neurodevelopmental problems. So I'm going to show you this whole um, Fragile X family here uh, where these individuals came in uh, to the clinic. Um, you know, this boy with Fragile X and autism, this girl with more milder involvement, the 38-year-old mother here has premature ovarian failure, anxiety, neuropathy, muscle pain. She was eventually diagnosed with lupus. Her mother here, up one generation, has tremor and ataxia, fax tasks, and had a history of early ovarian failure. And then her father, the great-grandfather of these kids, has fax tasks and cognitive decline. So he actually has dementia along with neuropathy. So... Um, we study all individuals in the family. So this is a very busy slide, um, but I'm trying to show some overlap in terms of pathogenesis for all these different causes of um, autism spectrum disorder, tuber sclerosis, Fragile X syndrome, and Fragile X premutation, uh, 15Q duplication, MACP2 mutations, uh, differences in serotonin um, transmitter, and there's a lot of different processes that can go on, all leading to you know either abnormal synaptic connectivity, GABA glutamate imbalances, CNS growth and uh, reactivity changes. So there's a lot of cross overlap in terms of what causes cell death, what interferes with synaptic plasticity, altered expression, et cetera. I think I better, st oh, no, let me just continue just a little bit. I want, I'd like to show this picture because this is another cause of autism, PKU. Both of these girls have the same mutation. Uh, this one got early uh, intervention uh, because of newborn screening for PKU. And she has normal IQ and is marrying on this day, but her older sister was born before newborn screening um, was uh, able to detect this mutation. So this is one cause of autism that is curable by diet. And, you know, we've known this for a long time. And, you know, I think people in the autism field would like a nice cure like this for all causes of autism. Um, and, of course, uh, we do, um, you know, wonderful treatment. You know, I'm from University of Colorado, and Sally Rogers is one of my best friends, so I'm very instilled in the Denver model. Uh, you know, all of these variations on ABA intervention. Um, pivotal response training, I think, is very good, too. Uh, from the Kegels and, um, you know, all of these intervention programs. Sally Rogers has demonstrated really good efficacy in her intervention. It's been shown in other behavioral interventions for autism. You know, I, and I think these interventions are, are wonderful um, for multimodality treatment for Fragile X. Sally Rogers' intervention, I think, works really well for Fragile X, whether they have autism or not. Um, we do a lot of combining speech and language and OT therapy, uh, prompt therapy, this uh, prompt intervention developed by um, uh, Deborah Hayden and others. 
Uh, I think uh, Sally Rogers has published on uh, the intensive prompt intervention where there's a lot of tactile, you know, input to the mouth to really stimulate language, um, I think is an excellent uh, intervention and it's available online and we uh, do a lot of programs at our summer institute at the mind to teach therapists about this. Um, there is a really nice uh, website for the National Fragile X Foundation that has a whole section on special education intervention. I'm particularly interested in computer learning programs and um, uh, uh, programs that can enhance written language expression. But kids with Fragile X love computers and do very well on computers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, psychopharmacological intervention, but I want to spend some time, and since I only have a half an hour left, uh, talking about targeted treatments for Fragile X that I think can impact other causes of autism too, um, so I will do a lot. Um, the visual pathway um, uh, for static visual pictures works very well in Fragile X. Um, uh, this is the ventral visual pathway in the brain, the dorsal visual pathway that's more for visual motor processing and movement is much more problematic in Fragile X. Um, so um, we do a lot of visual schedules, which of course are very helpful in autism. This is a little about uh, prompt therapy. Uh, we're very interested in assistive uh, technology devices, particularly for the 10% of kids with Fragile X that are nonverbal. Uh, and these communication devices. Uh, we work with Peter Mundy at The Mind, who's developing virtual reality paradigms for autism intervention, which we think is going to be really helpful for Fragile X intervention, too. Um, and um, uh, I think that you will see more and more about virtual reality paradigms. We're working with computer gaming people for early intervention for young children with uh, Fragile X um, and games that can improve visual um, uh, motor perception, uh, executive function control. Um, so we're excited about some of these computer learning games that can be uh, started very early. Behavioral interventions, this is a a family in South America is showing me their best behavioral intervention for their wildly hyperactive kid with Fragile X um, and uh, other kinds of behavioral interventions, of course, uh, calming techniques, uh, you know, not reinforcing negative behavior, timing out. I mean, these are standard behavioral interventions that work for any child with really severe hyperactivity and, and hyperarousal. Um, I'm going to talk more about psychopharmacological interventions, but I think after the break, which I want to take now, uh, I'm going to be talking about the new targeted treatments for Fragile X that I think can help autism too. Um, and then if we have more time, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, autoimmunity and fax tests and premutation involvement. So let's stop for a break. I want to talk about targeted treatments, OK? I actually skipped all the sections that talk about stimulant medications and SSRIs. But I do want to say that mood stabilizers like Respiridone and Abilify can be very helpful for individuals with autism. And also, Abilify is probably the best medication out there that's available clinically. Uh, for Fragile X syndrome because it actually decreases um, anxiety along with stabilizing mood, decreasing aggressive behavior, and um, uh, it just kind of helps in organized thinking and, and calming these individuals down. But I am really most excited about targeted treatments, and these are treatments that are related to understanding the neurobiological changes in the DNA in Fragile X and what that does at the synapse. Um, I want to reiterate that FMRP, uh, this red triangle, takes up 
messenger RNAs, probably from more than 100 genes, drags these messages down to the synapse, and it sits on these messages and regulates translation, as we've talked about. But one of the very important pathways that it regulates is called the mGluR5 pathway. And I apologize for being so molecular, but the only way you're going to understand these targeted treatments is to hear some about what makes synapses strong and what makes them weak. And the mGluR5 pathway, which stands for metabotropic glutamate receptor 5 pathway, so it's part of the glutamate system, is a pathway that leads to long-term depression. Now, LTD, or long-term depression, doesn't mean psychiatric depression. It means the process of weakening synaptic connections. So how do you weaken synaptic connections? Well, it actually is a process of pulling in receptors. And these glutamate receptors called the AMPA receptors are really important for learning and cognition. And when they get pulled in or internalized, it leads to a very weak synaptic connection. And this pathway, the mGluR5 pathway, leads to weak synaptic connection through this process. But guess what? FMRP is the main inhibitor of the mGluR5 pathway. So if you don't have FMRP, as in Fragile X syndrome, guess what? This pathway is upregulated. So there's weak synaptic connections all around the brain. So this was first discovered in the Fragile X mouse model by Kim Huber, working in Mark Baer's lab. And so this is a really exciting development because we can use mGluR5 antagonists to reverse this process. And guess what? These mGluR5 antagonists work really well in the animal model, okay, for Fragile X. They actually cure the cognitive problems, the seizures, et cetera, and I'll show that in a slide. But this slide just shows the difference between the knockout mouse and the wild-type mouse. And when the Fragile X protein is not there, many other proteins get upregulated because their inhibition is released. So there's a dramatic process of um, uh, the development of weak, long, thin, and immature synaptic connections compared to normal synaptic connections in Fragile X. And what does this mean? When you study how the brain solves math problems in the MRI, and this is in uh, girls here, this is a control group, when they're solving math problems in the MRI, uh, lots of areas of the brain light up, so they're able to recruit uh, a real big neural network to solve math problems. But here's Fragile X girls. These weak synaptic connections don't allow you to recruit the neural network you need to solve math problems, okay? And that's the biggest academic deficit, even in normal IQ Fragile X syndrome patients, math. Um, so we want to reverse this, and this is called the mGluR5 theory of Fragile X. There's an enhancement of mGluR5 activity related to the absence of the fMRP inhibitor. And this leads to enhanced long-term depression and these weak synaptic connections it what is what causes intellectual disability or mental retardation. And these connections are throughout the brain. If we use mGluR5 antagonists, we can improve behavior, seizures, cognition in the animal models. There's lots of evidence for this, whereas if you lowered fMRP, you pull in those AMPA receptors, and if you add back MMR, fMRP, those AMPA receptors go right back out and strengthen the synaptic connection. If you cross a Fragile X mouse with an mGluR5 deficient mouse, you cure Fragile X syndrome. That's pretty exciting. The only thing you don't cure is the macro orchidism or the big testicles, but that's okay. <laughs> My usual line is we think of that as a strength in Fragile X. Okay, so the mGluR5 antagonist, mPEP is the one that's been used in the animal models, but that's too toxic to use in humans. 
Um, but there are many other MGLUR5 antagonists. Phenobalm is one that we have used in humans. Lithium has some effect uh, on the MGLUR5 system, and actually lithium is a really good uh, medication in Fragile X. But Phenobalm, uh, we did a trial of Phenobalm, and it was just great in patients. It was a single dose. And just after a single dose, you could see dramatic improvement in the hyperactivity, the anxiety, in the eye contact. And it was a very exciting day when we did uh, our first uh, Phenobomb trial in Fragile X. But there are many other MGLUR5 antagonists that are coming online. Um, there's uh, one being developed by Seaside Therapeutics. Uh, uh, Novartis has one, Roche has one. Uh, the Novartis one has been tested in Europe, and it is good in adult Fragile X patients, and it's going to come to this country. And Roche has another MGLUR5 antagonist that we hope to start trials in adults with Fragile X in September. Um, there's a medication called uh, r baclofen which is a racemic form of baclofen that is actually a GABA agonist that can downregulate the MGLUR5 system. And we're studying that right now in individuals 12 and older with Fragile X syndrome. And our baclofen is supposed to be very good in autism without Fragile X. And so um, uh, Seaside Therapeutics is starting an autism trial very soon um, also. Now, minocycline uh, I want to talk about because this is uh, an antibiotic that lowers uh, MMP9. But before I talk about that, let me show you just this r baclofen structure. And r baclofen is 15 times more potent than regular baclofen, and that's why r baclofen is, a, is a FDA approved, but only for research studies right now. Um, there will be other medications that can upregulate the GABA receptor because that is downregulated in Fragile X. Ganaxalone is one that we hope to try in the future. Uh, this is just the structure of ganaxalone. But let me get to the minocycline studies. So the absence of FMRP. Remember how I talked about a lot of proteins get upregulated without the Fragile X protein? Well, MMP9 is another protein that gets upregulated. This protein is also really important for synaptic structure. It is probably ultimately regulated by MGLUR, but it's an example of another protein that gets upregulated. It is definitely elevated in Fragile X syndrome. And minocycline, uh, an antibiotic, a tetracycline antibiotic used to treat a variety of infections, uh, and also used, it's a, it's a great treatment for acne in adolescence. It's probably most commonly used to treat acne in adolescence. But minocycline happens to lower MMP9. Um, it also uh, has some effects on the immune system, and it changes around cytokine and chemokine profiles. Um, it... Um, has been helpful for some neurodegenerative syndromes, and we're actually going to be studying it in, in fax tests soon. And actually, some of the other MGLUR5 antagonists uh, can be helpful for Parkinson's disease. Um, and so we're excited to see as to whether it could be helpful. Some of these other MGLUR5 antagonists could be helpful in fax tests, too. So um, some of these new medications have a lot of cross uh, benefit to other disorders. But anyway, uh, there is a minocycline trial going now, on now in autism. Sue Suido is doing that. But minocycline is uh, a medication that can cause um, grain of the teeth when it's used in children that don't have their front teeth in uh, yet. And so... Um, uh, that's one of the reasons why it's not used in young children. But in the Fragile X knockout mouse, if you give minocycline for one month after birth, it normalizes synaptic connections. And that has some carryover uh, even a few months down the line. Now, they saw improvement in the Fragile X knockout mouse in an anxiety and in also some cognitive tasks on the Y maze. 
Um, and um, so this is very exciting that minocycline could be a targeted treatment in Fragile X. Again, um, there was just a paper that came out about antioxidants, including alpha tocopherol, which is vitamin E, and acetyl carnitine, and, and folic acid is also an antioxidant, that this may be very important uh, for, uh, in the Fragile X mouse model, but also in, in patients. It just hasn't been studied a lot in patients. Folate has been studied a little bit, but, um, and it has some behavioral effects. But, so there's going to be more studies done there. But let me just show you. I think I have a survey here about minocycline. This just shows MMP9 is a very important protein for the development of the synapse. Um, in um, the Fragile X knockout mouse, which is here, compared to the wild-type mouse, and here's the Fragile X knockout mouse treated with minocycline. But um, the synaptic uh, dendritic spines here are normal here, and they're long and thin and immature here, and they're improved here, but it's a little bit difficult to see, so let me just show you the quantitative thing here. In the wild-type mouse, the mature dendritic spines, which are the mushroom-shaped spines, they're fat and mature, compared to the long, thin philopodia, which are immature. Uh, the immature spines are much more so in Fragile X compared to the wild type, and the mature spines are underdeveloped, but when you add minocycline, it brings it back to the normal state. So this was published online in October, and a lot of families jumped on it and wanted to try minocycline right away. So uh, just to give you some background, um, it was in 1963 that the FDA and the ADA acknowledged that you have these dental problems with minocycline used in early childhood because the tetracyclines actually chelate calcium and incorporate them into the bones and teeth. Minocycline was introduced in 1967. It has less phototoxicity compared to regular tetracyclines, greater GI absorption, it penetrates the CNS, less calcium binding, so less frequent tooth staining, and it has anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective properties. Uh, overall dental staining after about a month's worth of minocycline only occurs in up to 6%, um, but it can also stain other tissues. Oxidation tends to bring out the dark colors, so maybe treatment with vitamin C at the same time may reduce oxidation. Minocycline sometimes can cause increased intracranial pressure. We call that pseudotumor cerebri, so we discontinue it if headaches occur. Sometimes emesis or GI upset can be a problem, and sometimes you can get an allergic or lupus-like rash with long-term minocycline treatment. So this just shows what the grain of the teeth looks like. But you can treat that with dental plating. Here's some dark coloration that happened with long-term minocycline uh, treatment. But again, you can correct that with dental plating. Here's some more grain of the teeth. I'm not sure how well that shows up there. So a lot of families are thinking, well, what's it going to be? Good synaptic structure or gray teeth, you know? Basically comes down to that. Um, and uh, one very important issue is that, um, of course, calcification of deciduous teeth is going on uh, in young ages, even in utero. Um, but the permanent teeth don't start to calcify until about six months. So there may be a window of opportunity in the first six months. And of course, minocycline is available by prescription. So we decided, because I've uh, followed about 40 patients that have been on minocycline, either from their primary health care providers or was started clinically by me or others, and so we decided to do a follow-up questionnaire. You know, uh, two adolescents got headaches right away and went off, and one individual had diarrhea and vomiting and went off. So of the 37 who stayed on for at least two weeks, uh, you know, about 50% were on the autism spectrum disorder, um, average age about 12 years, and minocycline mean treatment was um, uh, three months, but two weeks to 12 months. So it did, it did seem to, we actually divided the data between those treated less than seven years of age, and the blue bars are those who are older than seven, and we only had about seven children 
but actually a lot of them uh, improve their language. And again, this could all be a placebo effect, and so I'm just showing you this data so that I think this data tells me that we have to do a controlled study of minocycline, um, particularly in young children, because young children, I think, have the biggest effect. Um, uh, in some, academic abilities were thought to be better, but in several, there was uh, a worsening of the hyperactivity. So there can be some downside of minocycline, and uh, in a uh, inattention did improve, um, and uh, focusing impulsivity did not improve. Um, overall, individuals less than seven years of age, um, most of them had some degree of improvement from the parent's perspective. Um, those older than seven, there were some subtle um, uh, improvements in in many of these areas um, and for those of you who might have older children that uh, were treated with minocycline I think there is some benefit and certainly worth a controlled trial um, so that is one targeted treatment that is available now um, and the others again uh, we're going to do a phenobom study um, in adults that will be a longer term study the Novartis agent and the Roche agent are coming this year for studies at least in adults. Um, I think we'll do a controlled trial of minocycline in younger children. We're particularly interested in babies that we diagnose in the newborn period because we have a, a newborn screening program now going. Um, so we're particularly interested in all of the you know much more intensive interventions we can give to the babies. Uh, diagnosed with Fragile X very early on. And so we may actually do a controlled trial of one month of minocycline uh, to see if it can uh, improve synaptic connections. Um, I wanted, because we have a number of carriers in the crowd, I wanted to show... Um, just actually, just one hand. It's okay if you, if you miss. That's in okay. In terms of the intention tremor in fax tests. So this is an older male carrier. He's actually the first one that we diagnosed with fax test. So this intention tremor with finger to nose touching uh, becomes much more dramatic. They um, can have problems in just pouring or eating and ataxia, which is part of fax test, has to do with difficulty in uh, tandem walking, you know, heel to toe walking. Okay, turn around. And so individuals oftentimes can have problems with falling. Um, many of these individuals have Parkinsonian features, so often misdiagnosed as Parkinson's disease, autonomic dysfunction, either hypertension or orthostatic hypotension. Um, psychological features are very common, like anxiety, depression, or becoming more reclusive, and neuropathy, uh, painful neuropathy. Uh, in the lower extremities is common, and on MRI we see white matter disease and what we call the middle cerebellar peduncle sign. Um, we also see inclusions in neurons and astrocytes, and these inclusions can be throughout the brain in individuals uh, where we've done neuropathological studies after death related to fax tasks. The inclusions are most dense in the hippocampus and in the amygdala. And, um, and so we think that um, they are caused by too much message binding with other proteins and pulling these other proteins into inclusions. There's a variety of dysregulation of other proteins that can lead to early neuronal cell death. Premature ovarian failure or primary ovarian insufficiency occurs in about 20% of women with the premutation and an additional 23% can have menopause before age 45. So it just really shifts the curve down about when menopause occurs, but it also can cause an elevation of uh, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, even in women that are normally cycling, but definitely as they move into menopause, they can get an elevation of FSH. I wanted to just talk about a uh, medical history that we did on 146 women with the premutation between the ages of 20 and 84 compared to controls. Um, and again, this is a mom with the premutation with her uh, 
child with fragile X syndrome. So we divided those. 18 of them had fax tasks, and we matched that with age match controls. And then non fax task women um, with controls. Now, fax task only occurs in about 8 to 10% of women with the premutation. Um, and um, we also see. Uh, Actually, a similar incidence of premature ovarian failure, whether you have fax tasks or non fax tasks. So, again, about 20% here, only 13% here. So, having premature ovarian failure does not mean that you will go on to have fax tasks, although I think both disorders are related to RNA toxicity. I think in primary ovarian failure, the granulosa cells that support uh, the ovum they die off, and that's why uh, you can get ovarian failure, because uh, it needs those support cells. Um, thyroid dysfunction, 50%, and it's usually hypothyroidism of individuals with fax tests, 50% have thyroid dysfunction, significantly different than controls. Uh, hypertension in over 60%, and hypertension is very significantly different than controls who are age matched. So we know it's part of the RNA toxicity uh, process. Uh, fibromyalgia in 43%, definitely different than controls. So some of these pain syndromes, muscle pain uh, that hasn't been diagnosed as fibromyalgia, that is in 76%. So pain syndromes, not only neuropathy pain, but muscle pain, and fibromyalgia definitely can be a problem, particularly in older female carriers. Um, and females, of course, are much more predisposed to autoimmune disease than males. Um, the, uh, later on this week, I'm going to Switzerland to talk about, um, to talk with the Roche people at a conference on fragile X and autism, but they're going to present data on these mglur 5 antagonists, which they feel are very helpful for chronic pain syndromes. So um, the mglur 5 antagonists are helpful for migraine and chronic pain, and migraine is very much increased in individuals with the premutation also. So it could be that some of these chronic pain problems that we see in, in older carriers could um, be improved. Um, with mglur 5 antagonists. I just want to point out here, in this study, we had a, a few women that had MS, but because the numbers are small, it wasn't significantly different from controls. Um, but we do see about 2 to 3 percent of women uh, with the premutation develop MS. Now, I used to think it was just misdiagnosed and really was fax tasks. But here's a woman <clears throat> with the premutation who was diagnosed at 43 years of age with MS and died at age 52. Um, and when she died, and she was diagnosed with the premutation just a couple of weeks before she died, but she had classic MRI findings of white matter disease typical for MS. And uh, after death, she had very active inflammatory lesions consistent with MS, but she had inclusions also all over her brain. So she had both fax tasks and MS. So fax tests can occur together uh, with other uh, syndromes. So I just want to point out that tremor and ataxia are the main diagnostic criteria for fax tests, but hypertension, psychological problems like anxiety, depression, migraine, fibromyalgia, uh, urinary problems. Uh, we also see testosterone deficiency, hypothyroidism, uh, autonomic dysfunction that can lead to impotence is very common uh, among individuals uh, with these neurological problems. A treatment for carriers, we always want to treat hypertension because hypertension going untreated leads to more white matter disease in the brain. We always want to treat the psychiatric problems, decreasing anxiety and depression, because depression can lead right into cognitive decline and uh, fluoxetine or other SSRIs stimulates neurogenesis. And that's what you want to do in aging brains. You want to stimulate neurogenesis. The other thing that stimulates neurogenesis is exercise. And that is important for every one of you out there. So you exercise not only to feel better, but it stimulates more neurons.
neurons in your brain, and everybody can use more neurons in your hippocampus, okay? Everybody. Um, we want to avoid oxidative stress damage. We do recommend antioxidants, and I think we got to do a lot more research. Uh, processes like general anesthesia are really traumatic and kill off neurons, and so avoid general anesthesia. We're very interested in neuroprotection, lithium. We're looking at memantine or nemanda. We're doing a controlled trial on nemanda right now in fax tests, and we think it can be helpful uh, at least uh, initially. So also avoiding alcohol and you know other bad things you can do to your body um, uh, that kill off neurons. Smoking kills off a lot of neurons. So all you smokers out there with the pre, just stop smoking. So who to test? Uh, and the blood test for Fragile X is real easy. You. Every insurance company covers FMR1 DNA testing, even state programs like Medi-Cal or Medicaid uh, does it. Any child with or adult with intellectual disabilities, mental retardation, autism, autism spectrum, or autistic-like features, all of those individuals should be tested. Someone with a borderline IQ or learning disabilities or ADHD and features of Fragile X, they should be tested. Women with reproductive or fertility problems, particularly those with elevated FSH, they should be tested. Uh, those with late onset tremor, ataxia of unknown origin, I actually think we should be testing chronic pain clinics because I see that problem all the time. Multiple system atrophy, atypical Parkinson's disease, you know, these kinds of neurological problems should be tested. We're doing newborn screening. I actually think very strongly that Anxiety disorders, selective mutism, you know, over-anxious disorders. There's a huge number of psychiatric uh, populations that I think should be tested. Now I'm sensitive to the fact that the, the upper end of the premutation is, uh, you know, as fMRP goes down, mGluR5 goes up. And guess what? mGluR5 drives um, addiction and drinking. You know, uh, that's a whole nother field, you know, addiction. And so I used to think that, uh, you know, a lot of old guys, particularly at the upper end of the premutation, that I see a lot of alcoholics in the upper end of the premutation. And I used to think they drank because they were anxious and maybe starting to have neurological problems. But now I think that it's mGluR5 uh, elevations in the upper end of the premutation that's driving. Uh, addiction problems. Um, neurological populations like multiple sclerosis, normal pressure hydrocephalus. Oh my God, before anybody does surgery on this, they should be tested for the premutation because I can't tell you how many guys with fax tasks have surgery for normal pressure hydrocephalus, which they don't have, and they just fall apart after that surgery, go downhill. Um, we're doing uh, newborn screening at our center and at Rush University. But OBGYN clinics, I think, should screen prenatally. And we're very interested in what is the best intervention for babies with Fragile X. So I'm writing a grant now about um, using Sally Rogers' early um, Denver model intervention combined with maybe some additional uh, interventions for babies uh, to see if we can really enhance uh, their outcome, uh, which I'm sure we can. You can get more information at FragileX.org about all kinds of, you know, all the treatment centers that are around. There's 18 FragileX clinics throughout the U.S. I'm sorry I didn't include a map, but there's not a clinic here. And there should be a FragileX clinic here because um, all of, you know, the FragileX families, not all, but a lot of them come out to California to get you know, treatment and intervention, and I think the treatment should happen right here. And you guys have a lot of expertise, and you just need to start testing and screening, and then I think you'll identify the individuals. And the Fragile X treatment centers will be included in many of these um, targeted treatment protocols, and you want all these good new mGluR5 antagonists here, not only for the Fragile X patients, but also for your autism patients. So I'm going to end there, and uh, Amy's going to do some talking here. And, uh, but I'll take questions at the end after um, Amy's lecture.
So I'm Amy Essler. I'm a new hire to the ASD clinic at the University of Minnesota, working with Robin Rumsey and um, Dr. Michael Reef. Uh, one of my first jobs after graduate school was working as a school psychologist in the St. Croix River Education District up north a little ways. Um, but I first started out as an aide to children with disabilities, many of whom had autism. So I've done a lot of things in this area and now moved on to mainly focus on diagnostic assessment and behavioral and early interventions for kids with autism. So my intention today is just to talk about interventions for ASD, um, focusing on the most common ones out there. I'm certainly not going to give you an exhausted, exhaustive list, um, but just to sort of familiarize you with what all these terms mean and um, what we know about them in terms of their research support. I had the good fortune of working on a study with Rondi very briefly at the University of Wisconsin, where I was before I came here. Um, Fragile X, it was word learning in Fragile X and autism. So there's a lot of really interesting language-based research going on in this field as well. Okay, so Rondi talked a little bit about this too. Autism is a neurobiological disorder. Um, so we define it basically on behavioral criteria and the criteria which are in the DSM-IV were pretty much developed by a panel of experts um, they were often, many of them were developed before we had a lot of hard research on what the features were. So it's a consensus diagnosis. It's not, you know, a diagnosis like diabetes is. So, and it's also a changing diagnosis. The DSM-5 will probably have a different way of organizing the symptom areas of ASD. For example, the current criteria don't work very well for kids under four who wouldn't necessarily have a best friend yet, um, may not even have pretend play yet. So some of those things need to be adjusted. We don't have a neurobiological marker, as I said. Um, we're finding out more about genes that may underlie the syndrome. But every, even when we find an abnormality using CGH, you know, just a little deletion or a duplication, we, we really don't know how often things like that occur in the general population. So it's hard to really say this is the reason this child has autism. We found a, you know, a genetic abnormality. I mean, we, we all might have some of those. So what I want you to do, though, is imagine, so what kind of underlies this whole presentation and thinking about which interventions to choose or which to recommend. Imagine if your child were given a diagnosis of autism, and some of you don't have to imagine that it, it's happened to you. There's not a cause known. We don't know why it happened. It could be you're the first person in the family to have a child with autism. Um, it's really hard to feel a sense of control. You know, we don't know why this happened, but it happened. We don't really know what might occur. You know, at age two, we don't know exactly you know, who's going to turn out to be a high IQ kid with autism or a child who never learns to speak? And in some cases, we don't know exactly what you can do to make sure your child has the best outcome. Um, so often, you know, last year and the year before that, I was seeing all kids with autism age two. So I was often, I almost always was the first person to give the diagnosis. Um, and that was hard. I did that three times a week. Um, it's very stressful, but imagine what it was probably like for the parents. Um, and so it was a longitudinal study, so I got to see them a year later. Um, I have some friends who I've worked with who have children with autism, and sort of in talking to them, you know, a lot of what seems to go on as they're sort of processing the diagnosis is, you know, they have feelings about how long they waited before they got help. They might have had concerns in the first year of life, but just wrote them off. Um, and even if they come to see me at age 24 months, which is really, really early, they still think, well, why, I should have come at 12 months and we would have had a year of intervention under our belts. Um, they wonder, could I have prevented this? Could I have caused this? I've had parents ask me things like, you know, I was on an antidepressant before I realized I was pregnant. Do you think I gave this to my child? You know, parents are new to this. They're, they're not people who have lived and breathed this the way that, you know, people like me have. So they don't always know um, what they might have done to, to have their child develop autism. Then they go home and they're faced with all kinds of information. 
uh, in Wisconsin, I gave them all these numbers to call because there was a waiver system where if you had a diagnosis of autism, you could be on this two-year waiting list to get basically free early intervention um, paid for by the state, two-year waiting list. Um, but you could get it if you waited long enough. When it was originally uh, developed, you could get it right away, but then more and more kids were diagnosed and the state you know, budgets were tighter. So they go home, they spend eight hours on the phone trying to find the right person to get on the right waiting list and get the right paperwork in. Um, then they realize, oh, you know, I have two years to wait now, what am I gonna do? They go on the internet, they find all kinds of information. There's often peer pressure I'm finding out about where, you know, my friends have told me, God, you know, the, I went to this parent support group and everybody was on my back that I'm not doing the GFCF diet. Um, and even some national organizations say, you know, you should try this exact therapy and just see if it works. And some of those therapies are really hard to implement or you might not have the resources available to you. Um, but as a parent, you feel really guilty if you haven't tried everything. Um, and we as diagnosticians and ongoing service providers really don't do a good job of supporting families in the follow-up. We don't have care coordinators. Um, we don't have people to kind of follow the families as they're making these decisions. And you know, people like me, I'm not even all that available to talk to on the phone. You know, I'm, I'm busy. So um, if you get a hold of me at the right moment, then you're lucky and I'll talk to you. But if I'm not available, it's really hard. Um, you know, I was thinking about what's, what's a good model that we could use for the kinds of coordination that families of kids with autism need. And I was thinking the only service that really does this is hospice. <laughs> you know, and by that time, you're, it's over. You're, you're not Gonna, you're not gonna get out of hospice, mostly. So we as Americans kind of don't do what we need to do until it's too late. Um, so, you know, someday we'll get a big pot of money to be able to do care coordination. But for now, we'll just have to go with what we know. So autism is a heterogeneous disorder. We have very diverse outcomes across the spectrum from kids who are completely nonverbal uh, with, you know, severe profound cognitive impairments and low adaptive skills to very high IQ and superior vocabularies. In the past, people used to think, you know, the majority of kids with autism had intellectual disabilities, but now it's really probably less than 50%. Um, I found, though, that with my families I was initially diagnosing, they really didn't realize that there was such a high rate of cognitive impairments with their child's, with autism. So it's kind of like a double whammy. First they get the autism diagnosis, then they find out that their child's significantly behind where they should be in development, and it's, that's almost harder to take than, um, than the autism diagnosis. The social impairments also are diverse. Um, we don't really have a great measure of severity of autism as much as we talk about you know, what's severe, what's mild. That's often parents' first questions. Where is he on the spectrum? We don't know what average autism is. So it's really hard to say where someone is on, on the spectrum. It's often defined in terms of your IQ and your language level, but not so much on what your social impairment is. I had a really brilliant um, guy that I used to work with, uh, high IQ, but his autism, I would say, was pretty significant. I would say, hey, Dan, how's it going? And he would say to me, Salmon be ch Solomon B. Chase. And I would say, what? And he loved U.S. Secretaries of the Treasury, so he would just kind of com come up to people in mid-sentence about U.S. Secretaries of the Treasury and talk at length about them. And so I was totally confused. And this other guy, Rayhan, who also was very smart and had autism, a little bit less socially affected, said, oh, don't listen to him. He's just talking about U.S. Secretaries of the Treasury. He loves to do that. So both those guys had autism and similar IQs, but clearly one was a little bit more socially appropriate than the other. Um, there have been, there's been attempts to sort of define the social characteristics of kids with autism. Um, there are a couple personality profiles, if you want to call them that. One is kind of the avoidant, passive, indifferent type of kid who just sort of seems really in their own world and sort of shut off from people and not very responsive. And then there are some kids with autism who are almost overzealous in their approach. So they go up to everybody sort of indiscriminately, but it's often inappropriate, um, like Dan and his US Secretaries of the Treasury. So autism has been around since, I think, the 40s. Well, it's been around since before then, but we've known about it. 
but we're still really learning a lot about how to treat it. Um, there's no drug for autism. Uh, maybe there will be, based on what Rodney was talking about, but at this point, there's no drug to target the core features of autism, the communication and the social impairments. Um, so to help guide researchers and practitioners, Back in the late 90s, a committee of experts was convened, um, which was initiated by the National Academy of Sciences. And they, and this was all distilled into a book called Educating Children with Autism, which is edited by Kathy Lord. Um, I should tell you, Kathy, I used to work for Kathy, and she's kind of my mentor, so I'm a little biased about how great this book is. But um, it was a huge panel of experts, and they came together to sort of make sense of the treatments out there and how much research support there was for them. So uh, these were the leading people in the field. They reviewed research that met certain criteria to be included in their um, review. So there had to be, in these treatments, enough description of the curriculum, or maybe even a manualized curriculum, so that it explained enough about what the treatment was for people to draw conclusions about it. So a lot of times when I'm reading articles about interventions, they say, oh, we did this you know, great, I don't know, uh, vocational skill intervention, and then they don't tell you anything about what was in it and what the actual day-to-day -day treatment looked like, so it's really hard to know then um, what pieces worked or if it was just some other thing that happened that led to better outcomes. So they also wanted to have studies that compared those specific interventions to other kinds of interventions or to a comparison group that didn't get the intervention. So there had to be some sort of comparison group, not just everybody got the treatment, what happened to them. And they wanted to have large enough group sizes to see some sort of statistical effects. Um, so a lot of studies on behavioral interventions have been single subject research designs, and it's really difficult to know if that's going to generalize to other children. So they looked at comprehensive programs that were giant packages, but also really wanted to see what the active ingredients were. Were there certain features that were consistent across these different programs that we might point to to say, this is what's effective? So they wanted to have a systematic, you know, a planned out way of reviewing these studies. They also wanted to look at treatments that had support from independent studies. So, you know, I remember seeing Gary Mezeboff talk. He was, he's a professor at North Carolina, has done a lot with the TEACH program. And he was saying, you can either be an interventionist or you can be a researcher. But it's really hard to be both. So if you're an interventionist, all of your energy is going into the kids who you're working with and how to tweak it so that they're successful. Um, and you really don't have, it's almost contradictory to your job to try to systematize things for research purposes and be, you know, more neutral about it. So they wanted to have uh, studies that had independent groups of people who did not, you know, perhaps make money off the intervention um, and compare the results from those. So the greatest number of well-documented studies used behavioral approaches, otherwise known as ABA approaches. Um, there have been developmental approaches that have been documented with smaller sample sizes. Um, I would say that the Denver model that Randy was talking about is a, one that we put under the developmental approach category, so there's a little bit more information, more support for that now. But really, there's not a lot of difference in terms of the strategies and the underpinnings of behavioral and developmental interventions, and they've become increasingly integrated. Um, you know, a lot of people think behavioral intervention means ABA or LOVAS. You're sitting at the table, you're doing discrete trial, you're getting, you know, part of a gummy bear as a reward for doing the right thing. And that's not what behavioral is. Actually, if I um, pretended, if I were holding a cookie and didn't give it to my child until they said cookie, that's a behavioral intervention, right? So um, there's all kinds of, they're very integrated now. I remember um, there are some important differences, though, in how, I guess, concrete or direct the instruction methods are. So I had this family in Wisconsin who actually moved to Wisconsin from Canada. 
to get the fantastic treatments available in Wisconsin. So that's really saying something if Wisconsin has better treatments than Canada. But anyway, this guy was a plastic surgeon, um, and so he was you know, very smart, and his wife was very smart, and their son was very smart, but had autism and some language delays. So they enrolled him in the full tilt, 40 hour a week Wisconsin Early Autism Project, which is an ABA behavioral approach. And he quickly mastered all of their lessons. And I, was, I kept saying, you know, get him away from the one-on-one -on -one instruction with the tutor. Like, do that 15 hours a week and then put him in a really good daycare because he needs to be around typically developing kids. He's got the language now, let's do that. And the dad said to me, you know, I think ABA is like communism. <laughs> It lifts everybody to a certain extent, but then you have to do something else to get farther. So, <laughs> I, I don't know, there's negative connotations with communism um, that I don't want to have applied to ABA, but I thought that was sort of an interesting way of describing it. So what were the characteristics that they found were critical to effective intervention? Number one, and this all comes from educating children with autism, which you can get online, I think I at this website, and you can get the whole book. I mean, it's annoying because you have to download each page, but you don't have to pay for it. Um, so the, the, the critical features are entry into intervention early, you know, really at the first sign of a problem. We're even moving that back now, just looking at kids who are at risk for autism and pouring on intervention before they show the full diagnostic spectrum. Um, in the studies that, we've, that have been included in the research, usually early intervention means before you turn four. Um, you need to be actively engaged in instruction for at least 25 hours a week, 12 months a year. And so I'm gonna say this a, a more than once, but it's not necessarily the placement of the child, but what you do with them. Okay, so not where you put them, but what that program involves. It needs to be active engagement. They need to be goal-directed, systematically planned activities. Even your free play needs to be planned with a goal. So there should never be a time, say you're running a really beautiful autism preschool program. There should never be a time where kids can just wander around and you know, stim or hand flap or do whatever. You know, even free play needs to have a goal. So maybe the goal is you're increasing their toy play. So they, the goal is that they make a new choice for a new toy. Or maybe it's turn taking that they're gonna do during free play in a less structured setting. Or maybe it's peer interactions. Um, it's not going to do you any good to have a child in an autism classroom if they're just parked there and it's glorified babysitting. Um, th and then it needs to be developmentally appropriate. So things that are typically mastered by that age group. And that's really important. You kind of lose sight of what typical kids do if you spend all your time with kids with disabilities. Um, and that's one thing that I didn't really get in my formal education. You know, we focused so much on kids with disabilities that I, when I went out into the field, I kind of didn't know, like, what do kids actually do at this age? So that's an important component to put somewhere in your training process. Um, one example is my friend Rebecca has a child with autism named Justin, um, and Justin was actually the first kid I ever diagnosed. He, at age, I think it was three and a half or four, had a behavior program on tying his shoes. And he wasn't doing very well, and they were getting sort of frustrated with him. And then Rebecca, for some reason, went to a kindergarten classroom and saw almost every kid getting their shoes tied by the teacher. And she's like, he's not even supposed to be doing this yet. So, yeah. Uh, and then ongoing program evaluation. That's basically another term for database decision making, which is hugely popular in Minnesota. Um, I'm also going to say many times that you know, you need to follow your interventions closely, and if they're not working, if you're not seeing something great happening after three, four weeks, then you need to change what you're doing. So another critical feature that I want to emphasize is this beautiful quote, to the extent that it leads to the specified educational goals, children should receive specialized instruction in settings in which ongoing interactions occur with typically developing children. Okay, so, Again, proximity to children is not an intervention. Kids with autism don't learn as much through observation as typically developing kids do. So that means you need to have, if you're going to have an inclusive program, which I think are great, you need to um, have adequate supports and resources. 
Um, so if you're enrolled in a general education classroom, you're a child with autism, and maybe you have some needs in terms of receptive language or behavior, you need to have extra supports in there, maybe a paraprofessional, maybe a you know, co-taught classroom with the general and special ed teacher, so that that child can be successful. You also need to pull the child out as needed for intensive, you know, maybe individualized instruction if it's a time in the general ed classroom when, when that child might not benefit. Okay, so, you know, I, I remember a kid in Michigan who basically was just forced to stay in the room. He would dart out of the room. And he was staying in the classroom for, you know, whole group instruction in reading. And he wasn't talking yet and wasn't reading either. And so the whole time they were just corralling him onto the carpet and trying to get him to stay there. And it was totally, you know, not anything he could benefit from. So it was like, why don't you pull him out right now and start working on your, you know, language interventions or his functional communication skills because this is not, not appropriate. Um, but you also need to facilitate the typically developing kids in interacting with the kids with autism. So they might not naturally know how to respond to kids with autism or how to you know, work a little harder to get them to interact. So you know, all of that needs to be planned out. Okay, why 24 hours a week? So this doesn't happen in Minnesota or Wisconsin because people really do a nice job with special education in, in those two states. And in fact, I remember moving to Wisconsin and people were like, can you, you know, write a recommendation into the report? These are school people. Can you write something in there so that I can justify giving him more services? And I was like, what? Because in Michigan it was all like, no, we can't give any services because it's a much poorer state. But why 25 hours a week? So this doesn't have to come from a birth to three program. It doesn't have to come from the school district. It just means that we need to have the kids actively engaged in 25 hours a week of intervention. Why 25 hours? Well, that was sort of pulled out because that's equivalent to a full year, full time school program. So if you take out recess, lunch, things like that, it winds up being about five hours a day. Um, we need to have that much time and we need to have it through the summer because there's a lot of regression and recoupment. Um, because children with ASD really specifically benefit from the structure of adults. If they are left unstructured, they spend less time in social interaction. They're not, as, they're not as intrinsically motivated to engage in interactions with people as typically developing children are. They spend less time communicating and they communicate about a narrower, narrower range of functions or topics. Um, they spend less time in non-repetitive focused activities like play or something goal-directed. So, um, you know, if left unstructured, they might, if they need something, go grab it on their own rather than communicating for it. They might, you know, engage in some sort of self-stimulatory behavior or repetitive behavior. And those aren't going to increase their cognitive development and expand their opportunities for learning. Um, I had a really well-meaning early childhood program in Michigan that just didn't have a lot of training and they're sort of overwhelmed. And I remember walking in and it was like, it was just really sad. There was a kid who didn't like a lot of light, so he was under the table, you know, flicking his fingers in front of his eyes and he was allowed to do that for like 20 minutes. So that's what he would, that's what that little boy would have chosen to do without some structured planning. Um, so what do we want to have as goals for our educational services? And this applies to both you know, private agency intervention services and school, special education, public school services. So really, we want kids to, be, to have the same outcomes or goals as anyone, and that's personal independence and social responsibility. Being able to do what they want to do in the com community. Now that might not be the same for everyone, but we need to be looking more at kids' well-being rather than hard and fast outcome measures. So the initial studies looking at outcome have looked at things like full-time employment, living on your own. Some kids with autism might not ever achieve that. So, so what, how can we define well-being in a way that's meaningful? Um, so a couple things off the top of my head are functional communication. That's something you need to be able to do what you want to do in life. Um, and enough control over your behavior or your moods or your emotions so that you can accomplish your goals. Basically, I mean, it's, it's about being in public without getting in trouble, you know, without getting yanked or people looking at you or people asking you to leave someplace. Um, 
And so what might that look like for your individual child? So some extreme examples, um, when I worked at Michigan, we had a boy come in who hated, hated, hated wearing clothes. Just hated it. And so we spent like an hour and a half battling with him to keep his clothes on. And he was 10, so you know he, he wasn't cute anymore to run around naked. And really, before we start working on math skills or whatever with him, he needs to keep his clothes on because he can't go anywhere if he's going to be naked. That's just the way it is. Um, and then I had another little boy, less extreme example, um, who just really had a hard time with any thing that wasn't in line with one of his rituals. If you turned left out of the driveway instead of right, two-hour tantrum. It just really bothered him, and it was clear distress. It wasn't like whiny. It was just like he was really, really upset by this. So we needed to work on a way of building his tolerance and having less emotional reactivity so that, you know, if he went out somewhere in public and some kid did something he didn't like or, you know, they didn't get to stop at the fish tanks at Myers first, they had to go to the cereal aisle first, it didn't result in a big meltdown. So those are some goals I think that we need to focus on a little bit more, um, you know, rather than words per minute reading to get kids ready for independence in life. The role of families is also very important. Almost all of the empirically supported treatments that were included in educating children with autism had a well-defined parent component. So, you know, parents can really do a lot to help their kids progress. This can take many different forms. Um, in Michigan, where there were few resources, I'm just saying Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, because that's really the only places where I've lived. So I'm not saying, like, Michigan is the model for bad and Minnesota, Wisconsin model for good. I'm just <laughs> using my experience. Um, so the level of involvement depends. There are some families in Michigan who really didn't have access. They were kind of rural. They didn't have a lot of ABA types of integrated programs available. So the parents went and received training on their own to be behavior therapists, basically. Some of them got that uh, BCBA uh, certification, and they implemented the full 30-hour-a-week program with their children. Others um, consult with another person who's a BCBA or a psychologist of some sort about doing some of the more parenty things like managing behavior or setting up routines at home that are conducive to the child's behavior and development. I think it's really important to involve parents on any sort of communication intervention because we communicate all day long and it's important to reinforce that in every environment. There are some new therapies that I'll tell you about at the end coming up that really give parents a specific role for intervention at the earlier ages um, in terms of building relationships or building language through relationship-based interventions. So the active ingredients that came out of this big study um, based on the review of comprehensive programs that had some evidence of efficacy. So these are the six kinds of instruction that really need to have priority in any intervention program for children, young children with autism. You need a functional, spontaneous communication system. I think we really need to think about that one. Um, in less, places that are less sophisticated in working with autism, it's like, oh, you have autism, I'm gonna do PECS. Well, PECS is great for some kids, but it's really clunky for other kids who have language. If, if I've seen kids actually go up and say, water, and then the, the teacher corrects them and has them pull out their pecs thing and stick it on the I want sentence thing, and it's like, what? how is that better than using your words? So, you know, we need it. it needs to be functional, it needs to be spontaneous, it needs to build on what the child's already doing, something that they can use anywhere, they don't have to carry it with them, and only go to the things like the Dynavox and the PEX when you really can't produce that speech on your own or sign on your own. Um, you need social instruction in various settings, definitely various settings, it needs to generalize. Play skills with peers, especially use of toys. Um, cognitive goals in natural contexts and um, positive appro approaches to address problem behaviors. So a lot of that involves your basic behavioral strategies to be used with any child who has behavior problems. You're reinforcing what you want to see, you're ignoring or doing planned consequences for what you don't want to see. And then functional academic skills when appropriate. Um, some kids can be real math whizzes or awesome at reading and have very little language skills. Um, so, you know, in those cases, if they're already really good at those things, you might focus your special ed time 
on things like, you know, functional communication or daily living skills, adaptive skills, and mainstream them for the academics if those are their areas of strength. Um, Justin, the little boy I mentioned earlier, reads far better than he talks, so a lot of times his mom writes out what she wants him to do for the day rather than telling him. Uh, so the most studied intervention is ABA. So parents who are new to the diagnosis, often the first thing they hear is, you should get ABA. Your son needs ABA. Um, and they kind of go, what's that? So it's a method, not a specific treatment. There's no one ABA book you open up and start working from. Um, it's basically using behavioral techniques to teach new skills. Positive reinforcement, differential reinforcement. It clearly demonstrates to the child what the correct response is, and that applies to any sort of skill you're working on. And it also is very concrete about what the incorrect response is. Okay, so it's just breaking things down into smaller components and teaching in a very direct way that the child can understand, because a lot of them can't understand lengthy explanations, um, and teaching the behaviors you want to see. It focuses a lot on prompting and levels of prompts. So what level of assistance do you need to provide to get um, the correct response? It's important to fade those prompts as well, or else you become prompt dependent. I've seen a couple kids who won't sign until somebody comes and moves their hands to sign, even though they can do this on their own. They've just learned that the pattern is, I'm holding the cookies, somebody comes and pushes his arms together, and then he gets more cookies. Not that this means more, right? So fading prompts is really important. Actually, do you know that if you have On Demand on your Comcast cable, there's, it's Autism Awareness Month, so there's all these little vignettes from the Discovery Health Channel on autism. And I watched one last night on a little boy with severe autism, and he was in a separate autism school. And I felt really bad. Um, it's probably an average situation. Um, I felt really bad for him, though, because the entire time he had an adult on him doing hand over hand. And it didn't look like, I mean, it was edited, but it didn't look like he ever had a chance to do something first. Like they just, it was time for him to take his tray over in the cafeteria. And it didn't look like they said, time to go or take your tray. They just shoved his hands on it and walked away with him. And so that's not, you can do ABA poorly, right? But that's not what ABA is. Okay, LOVAS is the most studied method. The story of LOVAS. Um, so what it often looks like is kind of that discrete trial training or the sitting at the table and doing sort of one-on-one -on -one drill and practice. Um, and it's, they often start with kind of hierarchical skills that get you prepared for learning. So an initial skill might be coming to the table and sitting down and staying seated for long enough to be able to attend to another person. And then you build from there. Again, the correct response is rewarded. Incorrect responding might be ignored or corrected. Often focuses on elimination of problem behaviors. I don't know if anybody saw those original Lovas films where I remember very, this is probably my undergrad psych, a little kid pounding his eyes and he had detached his retinas and they were doing behavioral interventions to get him to stop doing that. Um, usually provided at home, usually one-on-one, -on -one, you earn your way into inclusion. So once you've gained a certain subset of skills, then you start applying it to group situations. So what this might look like, um, you might have an adult and a child sitting at a table and you know you have three objects in front of them and this is a receptive language task. You say, show me chip and they hold up the chip. Okay, really simple example, but you can also build that into lots more complex skills. So LOVAS is often controversial because of, well, because of some of the components of the, the LOVAS intervention that were initially around. But also the original LOVAS study, the, most, the one you often hear about from 1987, it had 19 kids. 19 kids who got the, the LOVAS intervention and 19 who didn't. Um, and they found that about 47% quote recovered. Now they've sort of backed off from that word recovered, but what it really meant was that they had average IQ and violent scores and um, their teachers described them as indistinguishable from other uh, students. So follow-up studies found that these, the same group of kids maintained their best outcome results. 
Um, and then when it was replicated and implemented in more of a community setting, so it wasn't done at UCLA, it was done by community service providers, um, they had higher IQ and adaptive skills, but their receptive language and nonverbal skills didn't exactly uh, meet that best outcome status. Uh, so, you know, you can get really positive results. One of the things I would ask about those recovered kids is they were really looking at IQ and adaptive skills, and they weren't looking necessarily at social interaction. Now, developmental approaches, on the other hand, um, these focus, these actually use quite a bit of behavioral strategies, but their focus is on natural environments and sort of these foundational relationship skills. Um, you're following the child's lead, you're incorporating their interests into what you're doing, and the focus is on play and social interactions. There's some research on these approaches, but RCT means random randomized clinical trials. There's not like a random group of kids who got this intervention compared to a random group of kids who didn't. Okay, so one of the most popular ones is DIR or floor time or Greenspan. Stan Greenspan, um, sort of developed this form of training. And DIR stands for Developmental Individual Difference Relationship-Based Model. So that's a little bit, I don't know, they might want to work on that. So what this involves is you're building foundations for healthy development. And these are through making the child's interactions with their parents or with whomever meaningful and, and self-initiated. So floor time is different play activities the parent does on the floor or in play in natural situations with their child. Then there are problem solving type sessions um, that involve uh, setting up challenges for the child to solve to teach them something new. And that something new might be a way to communicate. So an example might be you put their favorite toy or their favorite food into a clear container that they can't open. Now they have to learn a new way of getting to that treat. And it might be going up to their parent and handing it to them, or it might be saying help, or depending on where the child is at. Uh, floor time also incorporates individual therapies like speech and language therapy, sensory integration, any PT that might be needed. Um, the educational program, again, you sort of earn your way into inclusion. Um, and then they also support incorporating other interventions. So this is kind of like a, a name brand intervention, DIR floor time. And they talk about um, biomedical nutrition, other sorts of treatment that have anecdotal support. Denver model, we've talked about a little bit, um, uses this kind of uh, theoretical background, and they want to bring the child back into the social mil milieu, they say. Um, this has a lot of family involvement uh, to carry out the strategies in different environments, and then there's time in an inclusive preschool. There's a lot of focus on imitation, um, communicating with others to get your needs met and to share interest, and building that intrinsic motivation to interact. Now I'm going to move on to things that I call blends, okay, because these are neither really ABA, classic LOVAS, and they're not really classic developmental either. Pivotal response training, that PRT, pivotal response training, gets thrown around a lot. And it took me, I mean, I think I know a lot about autism, um, but it took me forever to figure out what the heck this was. People kept saying, oh, you should recommend PRT. Okay, what's that? Um, what it is, is defining kind of foundational skills that cover the most targets at once. So these are some, it's not exhaustive again, but these are the classic types of skills that you want to build upon that will affect multiple areas of development. So the first thing you want to teach, using again positive reinforcement, is a motivation to interact. So teaching kids that it's actually fun, maybe you really love this toy, but it's even more awesome if you interact with your mom with the toy, or if you interact with this other kid with the toy. And then they see, you know, next time maybe they'll learn that it's more fun to bring someone else in. Responding to multiple cues is another one. Kids with autism often can really focus in on something very small and you're calling your, their name or something else is going on and they're, they're not even aware. So you teach them to sort of look up and be aware of these other cues in their environment that are important. Self-regulation, being able to be in charge of your emotions, um, being able to initiate interactions with others. 
Verbal behavior is another one that's increasing in popularity. So I often hear, you should do verbal behavior ABA. Um, and what this training program is, uh, it's, it's basically ABA or behavioral strategies, classic Skinner behavior strategies, but applied to spontaneous communication. So Vince Carbone does some really nice workshops all around the U.S. Um, he's got a really nice int introductory one that I kind of like. Um, but it, it blends the developmental into the behavioral because in producing spontaneous communication, you start with what the child already loves. So, um, and you use that also to reduce problem behaviors. So I remember he had this nice video where this kid comes into the school and he's just screaming, he just hates it, he's having such a bad tantrum, and this goes on and on for weeks. And all they do is sort of walk him into this room with the trampoline, they stick him on top of the trampoline, and as soon as he stops, and it might just be to go like, <gasps> before sobbing again, they bounce him on the trampoline. And so then he's, you know, eventually learning, like, if he doesn't cry, this awesome thing happens. And so they build from there. Or, you know, they... They have the thing of popcorn next to the movie. They stop the movie and they wait for the child to look at them or make a sound, and then they get the movie turned back on. So it's training them to use spontaneous communication um, to get what they want. There's a lot of emphasis on pacing. They do some discrete trial, but the pacing is really important. Um, it has lots of jargon, like mans and texts. Um, so I don't know if, if any of you have heard that before, who, you know, like parents, here's his manned graph, here's how many mans, you know, so that just means requests. Tax means the label. I don't know why they have fancy terms, but they do. Another example um, that's often used in schools is the teach method. That's looking at the culture of autism, what kids with autism, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and how to build upon those in a classroom environment. So how does a person with autism think and solve problems? How this often looks is it structures the environment to make it very predictable and to promote the child being independent and getting things done. Um, there's visual supports. So you, know, you, you might have three jobs that the child has to do, and it could just be a worksheet. It could be, I don't know, a hygiene task. And you might have a red piece of paper that says job one and something on top of that. Red piece of paper, job two red piece of paper, job three, and then a bin with a green piece of paper in it that says done or work done or take a break. And so you complete the jobs. When you're done, you put it in the bin. When there's nothing else in front of you, you get a break. Okay, so really clearly showing you what, your, what the expectations are. Um, we talked a little bit about, well, no, we haven't. So the LEAP and Walden incidental teaching programs are more inclusive programs that incorporate behavioral and developmental models. Um, the Walden program is one I know more about. That's Gail McGee down in, at Emory. Um, and this is a really nice program. So there's an inclusive preschool where there's maybe 50% kids with autism, 50% typically developing kids. There's actually a wait list for the typically developing kids as well as the autism kids, so that's great. And the kids are all, the typically developing kids are kind of trained to promote the other, the kids with autism's communication. Um, so they're increasing the amount of time the child is engaged in some sort of communication or learning task. Um, so I remember a video she showed of this little kid is playing next to this kid with autism and the kid with autism is just really loving the Ernie doll and he's not doing too much with it and the other kid takes the Ernie doll and just holds it over here <laughs> and then you know the little boy with autism is like Ernie and then he gives it back to him and says and then they have like a little to and fro about it. So it's not enough for him to just hold it and give it to him like then they engage in an interaction but there's some intentional communication built in there and kids can do that. What's difficult about those inclusive programs is that the training of the typical kids doesn't generalize to a new classroom. This is not necessarily natural for any of us to know how to best interact with a person with disabilities. So you end up having to train the new class of kids every year. School programs that are typical, um, I just kind of wanted to put this up there to just sort of say what often happens once you enter school for a child with autism. A lot of them go on IEPs if they need it. Not everyone with autism does. They often have collateral skill interventions, direct therapy for speech, OT, developmental adaptive phi ed. Behavior supports are common. Some schools have developed autism-specific classrooms that maybe implement a TEACH model or a LEAP model. Um, and transition planning is really important. 
Uh, one thing that a lot of parents complain about is once you hit high school, it's over. There's not a lot for you as a child with autism. So there are, are some, is some research going on looking at comparing different ASD programs to one another. So I know David Mandel in uh, Philadelphia is implementing like a STAR intervention program in half the schools and a TEACH, I don't know, I think it's TEACH, in the other half of the schools. And the classrooms are randomly assigned. So that's really exciting. Now we're starting to get people researching comparing one treatment to another. In the past, it's often been you're implementing a comprehensive program and comparing it to, quote, eclectic, like just whatever you feel like doing, or a blend of lots of different things. One of the questions that we have yet to answer is what, first of all, how far do we drift from the program purity? So, you know, Lovas' program at UCLA, uh, they have PhDs all over the place. They have a specific training program. They only get grad students to do it. If you distill that out into the community, there's only so many PhDs to go around and you, know, you get a lot of turnover. So what kind of drift happens? And how much fidelity or how much do we need to stick to that script to have the same effects? So like I said, ABD, ABA can be done badly. All of these programs can be done badly. And we don't know if they'll still have an effect. So simply having three pieces of paper with job one, two, three doesn't mean you're doing teach. OK, there's more to it. Um, and we don't exactly know what kind of teacher training is best or if there are individual factors that are best. Um, I'm a ADOS trainer. Um, ADOS is a diagnostic measure, and I train tons of people on it. Um, and there are people, nobody, nobody you would know, but there are people I've worked with in the past that I thought, you know, they just shouldn't give the ADOS. They're just not, they don't have it. They're not natural. So, um, you know, you always think people can be trainable, but some people just don't have the knack. Uh, complementary treatments. So these are things that have some anecdotal support. Uh, larger, if there are larger evidence-based studies on them, they haven't shown support, like diets have been uh, compared to no diet and have not shown group-level effects. But there might be individual children who benefit from these things. These are things that you know are out there. You can find them on the internet really fast. Parents kind of go to them hoping that they'll find this one magic thing. Um, I was listening to NPR last week, and there was a family of eight kids, five of whom had autism, and they did this music therapy, and lo and behold, their nonverbal five-year-old started talking. Um, I always am skeptical of treatments like that because, you know, if you've worked really hard with kids who aren't talking, you know that it's not just some switch that flips. But, you know, if it works for your kid, keep doing it. Um, so what's effective? We can't just address a simple question about whether a practice in special ed is effective. You have to say for whom the practice is effective and in what context. So in other words, no one thing is going to work for everybody. So active ingredients that we've identified throughout these comprehensive programs um, that we know to be in programs that work, frequency, duration, and intensity. So having regular therapies that have a long enough duration and a high enough intensity that meaningful skills are developed. So a criticism of birth to three is you're not going to get anywhere with an hour a week of speech if you have autism. That's true. Birth to three was not developed, though, for kids with autism. It was developed for kids who might have, you know, they need some school readiness skills. And maybe they, that group of kids can benefit from that level of intervention, but kids with significant disabilities can't. So we need to do something else. Um, Database decision-making, training and ongoing support, not just for the teachers, but for families. Uh, fidelity of implementation. Funding is really important. Uh, it's really hard to do something without money. I, I hate it when people say money can't solve the problem. It's like, well, it's kind of necessary. Um, so. One of the things about autism is that there's a lot of variability in outcome. So if we look at the group level, so this is a group of kids. The black dots are autism. The stars are kids with PDD diagnoses. And the open squares are kids with non-spectrum disabilities. So over time, if we're looking at language development, you can see the kids with autism, they keep making progress, but it's significantly lower than the other two groups. 
What's interesting is the non-spectrum kids start to level off. They're making less and fewer and fewer gains as time goes on. The PDD kids, you know, have a pretty nice trajectory. But if you look at the individual level, so these are all kids with autism. Each line is a different kid. So you can see the extreme spread there. The dotted line is, is average. And uh, you can see there's a lot of clustering at the bottom of kids with autism who don't make a lot of language progress. And that might be the kids who are still nonverbal. But there are some kids who make so much progress they're well above average. We also can't predict whether getting treatment at the individual level is going to necessarily lead to outcome. So here's a kid who has clearly speech language impairment in addition to autism, doesn't get much intervention. So this is a kid from Michigan. Here are his ADOS scores, which higher score means worse social behavior, worse repetitive behavior. And you can see he sort of stays up there, which is, might be something we'd expect because he didn't get intervention. Here's another kid, got intensive verbal behavior intervention. Um, and actually, it's not significant. It's not like he got worse on the ADOS, but he didn't really change either. So what, um, what do we need to, what predicts an individual's response, basically? Most of these studies of outcome have looked at IQ or special ed placement as the outcome. But where you're placed in special ed um, doesn't necessarily depend on you as an individual. It often depends a lot on what your district is like. So there's a little bit of research starting to look at this. Uh, there's, a couple, there's one study that was really good trying to predict what sorts of factors beyond IQ or language level would um, lead to kids responding from in, to intervention. So this is a small study Sharon Schreiben did, but they took six kids, three of whom they thought would be good responders, and three of whom they thought would not be good responders. And this was based on these skills down below. So having toy play, functional toy play, these are kids under age four, having uh, social approaches to others, being low on avoiding other people, doing a lot of vo verbal stim stimming, so making a lot of different complex sounds or maybe some, even some stereotype speech, and then being low on nonverbal stimming, so sort of repetitive motor mannerisms. And they found that um, those things, that it, what they predicted was true. The kids who were thought to be responders did respond better um, and make more gains. Other predictors that we know of are joint attention skills expressive language, particularly by age four and five. Um, how many in initiations you're already making on your own. So if you're a child who's already seeking out other people, chances are you're gonna build faster than a child who needs to be motivated to do that first. So there's also um, a new area of intervention that's coming out for kids who are at risk, perhaps not fully diagnosed yet. Um, we do this for kids who are baby siblings of, of kids with ASD, or who are showing some red flags in the first years of life. And what, what we're sort of thinking about is, you know, diagnoses are hard to get sometimes, especially before you hit school. So is there something that we can do at the screening level when we see that there are signs of concerns, but maybe not a diagnosis, and then, um, you know, do whatever we need to do for insurance or, you know, waiver purposes to get them enrolled in intervention? These tend to be parent implemented. So the parent integrates different strategies into their daily interactions and communication with their children. Uh, an example is the More Than Words curriculum out of Canada. Uh, there's a couple programs being researched right now. One's a um, looser early social interaction study that Amy Weatherby at Florida State is the author of. And that involves really integrating um, communication and natural interactions to a social routine and a play routine every day. And then the Denver model is also being adapted to little kids working on um, parent training to build imitation skills and joint attention. Um, so that's kind of a new area that we don't have a lot of information on. But you know, the hope is that we can instill a good amount of skills into kids early uh, that might mitigate some of the effects of autism. We don't know if we can prevent autism, but the hope is that we can build skills earlier um, to give them more positive outcomes. So I just put up some uh, websites for more intervention. Uh, I'm not advocating anything on all these websites, but these are some good ones that have comprehensive information and some nice resource packets. Um, and then we just, I just want to thank you for your time. And you know, we're at the University of Minnesota. If you want to contact us and ask any questions or, you know, 
find out more information. So thank you. It reminded me they, they spoke from two different worlds in some ways. Uh, it's a, it's a, the research plan of the National Institute of Mental Health is, is uh, summarizing in something called From Neurons to Neighborhoods. And it's the idea that uh, if we're really going to be successful in uh, behavioral health interventions, we have to be able to understand things all the way from the micro, uh, microbiology, molecular level, all the way up to the macro behavioral level. And I thought we had examples from uh, both parts of that continuum. Uh, I, it'll be fascinating to see how your answers uh, to questions either conform or take us in different directions. Um, so now is the time for questions. Uh, uh, for those of you who are um, in greater Minnesota sites, um, I, I wanna, this is the time where you get to make the choice. You either can leave and have your own discussions or you can stay online with us and email your questions in uh, to cmhdata um, at umn.edu and they will be uh, presented uh, to our speakers. Uh, for those of you who are still here in the audience, we should have folks circulating with microphones. We have one over here and, and one down here. Um, I'm also getting a signal from the cameraman that, that uh, uh, we'd like people to, was that, was that moving closer to the middle? Was that? Um, oh, I'm sorry, that curtain. I knew it was something about going like this. Um, uh, so I, I think we can start with questions. Um, anybody have questions for either of our presenters? Okay, I'm really specific. I'm an educator of first and second graders. And um, my question is for Dr. Hagerman. Um, math is a really difficult subject to be teaching to girls with fragile X. And um, I've read a little bit about interventions. Um, is there resources that have, you know, when you're solving math problems, you're doing one-to-one -one correspondence and that's not working. Is there resources of methods we can use in addition to what we have provided in our school? Um, yeah, there, uh, there are. Um, uh, Marsha Braden developed a uh, math educational program specifically designed to um, help um, individuals with uh, Fragile X learn math. And um, she has a website. It's marcia.braden. And um, B-R-A-D-E-N. And uh, she actually is in Colorado Springs, and I'm trying to think, I think if you Google her name, it can get you to the site. And I think that the National Fragile X Foundation also has it on their uh, list of materials available. So that FragileX.org website has, it's a big website, but they do have a page that has uh, resources and, you know, Could you, could you speak in the microphone? I'm sorry. Could you, could you repeat that for the microphone? <laughs> I can usually speak pretty loud, but um, <laughs> is it better to start? I mean, could, you know, like you're solving a math problem um, and it's too difficult for them. Do you wait till they can do one-to-one -one correspondence before you move to the next thing? Or do you just keep giving them experiences until they get big picture? My student I'm thinking of for reading, I just keep giving her things even though she hasn't quite gotten it yet and she's, excelling, and I'm wondering if I should do that for math. Oh yeah, I think you uh, try to present it in a lot of different ways and use every kind of thing that's available. Um, you know, the strength for kids uh, with Fragile X has to do with that visual pathway that is just static visual pictures too. And so um, uh, different visual things like that, you know, the touch math approach, you know, where you put dots on different parts of the numbers and stuff. 
that's real good. Any kind of visual uh, presentation to show um, concepts and equivalents and stuff, um, putting it in visual terms as much as you can, or concrete terms, um, that's a great way to do it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of concepts that I think that, you know, they will never get. And so, you know, using you know, calculators and other sorts of things is good. I think the assistive technology um, software and I guess Math Blaster, and that, there's a lot of different programs. I would use a variety of, um, you know, special education math programs too because they're really good with visuals. So I would use any and all um, approaches. I love Math Blaster. Yeah, <laughs> I see, yeah. Th those can also also be used as rewards for kids like who earn computer time. I had kids mm -hmm. who actually did Math Blaster and didn't realize <laughs> that their reward was actually math. So. Yeah, and um, you know it. Uh, there's a lot of different disorders um, that have math deficits associated with them. I mean, it's not just. Um, uh, fragile X, um, uh, Turner syndrome, uh, velocardiofacial, many different um, neurogenetic disorders have math problems associated with it. And we work with a psychologist, Tony Simon, who does a lot of work with velocardiofacial and uh, fragile X. And he's developing some early computer games that can be utilized because he thinks it's very much related to the visual spatial development. Uh, in the brain, and he's developing uh, uh, early computer programs that he thinks will help the development of math concepts. Arithmetic, though, versus math as are those basically arithmetic, or are those, you know, bigger like problem solving or um, geometry, all of those things, or is it more? Should I focus on arithmetic? Yeah. Yeah, I you know I think some of uh, higher math and algebra and stuff are just basically impossible for many <laughs> kids. So we're just talking about basic arithmetic here. Uh, we in basic math we teach um, algebra in first grade and all of those things. So I'm just wondering how high to reach for her. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. yeah. I, th I think a lot of math programs, it's, is it a spiral math program where you're touching on the different, yeah, those I think are really hard for most kids with disabilities, and you just have to go to an alternative curriculum. We have a question from Greater Minnesota. Yes, this is a question from Rochester. Um, where does a family go for genetic testing? Is there a lab that can do fragile X blood spot testing? Um, Actually, uh, the Fragile X blood spot testing was published last year in a paper in Journal of Molecular Diagnostics by uh, Flor Tassoni, um, who's actually at our center. We do the blood spot testing related to research, but other labs are learning blood spot testing, and we definitely want a lab here that could learn the blood spot testing. Uh, it'll be for research screening. Um, you. Uh, for the clinical available diagnostic testing, it's a, uh, a peripheral blood draw. It can be ordered through any physician. Any physician can order the Fragile X DNA test. Most university laboratories do do Fragile X DNA testing. Um, uh, there's a lot of commercial labs like Genzyme um, and um, uh, Athena laboratory diagnostics that that also do it. So most of the commercial labs will all do Fragile X DNA testing. Um, so any physician can order it. Um, you know, they every person who orders it, it will get sent off. Like if you're at a clinic or at a university, it'll be sent off to be done where it is contracted for. Um, so it may be done at the local university lab or through a commercial lab, depending on where the contract is done. Um, one of the least expensive places, I mean, most places charge between two and four hundred dollars for this, but it's covered by insurance companies. Um, 
the uh, laboratory, Sally Nolan's laboratory at New York State, uh, Department of Developmental Disabilities, uh, Ted Brown's Institute uh, in Staten Island, uh, used to do it at no charge, and now they charge a minimal fee, but if there is a problem in getting it locally, uh, it could be sent to that New York State lab, which is probably the least expensive. We, we routinely, you know, for kids that we see if we want to order Fragile X clinical testing, um, they often just get the blood drawn before they leave <laughs> the appointment um, through the pediatric clinic, and I'd imagine Mayo Clinic has. Yeah, Mayo has a lab uh, that does it, mm -hmm. and a lot of commercial labs do it. Now, is that going to be the same, though? Will you be able to see the pre-mutation? You mean, the, well, so the blood spot test is a very inexpensive test used for very large population screens, like high-risk groups. Um, and that is available for laboratories that want to learn how to do it. If the blood spot is positive, then it's confirmed by a follow-up clinical test. So say if you're doing newborn screening or, you know, say if you wanted to do the blood spot test here and it's developed by one of the laboratories here and that would be a research study maybe to look at everybody with a certain diagnosis or whatever uh, to see how many are positive for Fragile X, then it'll be followed up. If that's a research project, then it'll be followed up by the clinical DNA test. Um, I, I just, I'm sorry, I, I want to be clear that the microphone is not so people here can hear you, but so that people okay. out, out you know, elsewhere can. Okay. Um, I have a question that I have two kids with fragile X, and a lot of times they fall under the autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. But in, one, in what ways or would you say that it's different than autism? to help sort of differentiate them? Because I know some of the ways that's similar, but are there ways we should know that it is different? Well, so uh, about 50% will come under the autism spectrum. The ones that don't come under the autism spectrum are much more interested in social interaction. Uh, so they're not only interested, but they're much better with their social interactional abilities. They can still have a lot of autistic-like features like hand flapping, poor eye contact, perseverative speech, et cetera, but the key that makes them not in the ASD spectrum is their interest and enthusiasm for social interaction and their, their language abilities. Um, so it's just a very um, intrinsic key aspect about uh, social and uh, interactions and, and language that makes them not qualify for the autism spectrum. So all of these autistic-like features, it doesn't make any difference how much autistic-like features you have. It's really these core deficits in social interaction and language that differentiate them from the ones with autism. Do we have more Greater Minnesota questions? Yes. This is a question from Rochester. You stated genetic testing is essential. Essential to whom? Researchers, parents? Genetic testing is expensive, and a family's insurance either may or may not pay for it, or the copayment is extremely expensive. While it's clear that research is important, can researchers offer genetic testing at no or minimal cost? Yeah. Um, um, I think that knowing the genetic etiology uh, for the cause of their autism is essential for family members, essential to guide the therapy for the child. And if, it's, if this child is part of a research study, it's, of course, very important for the researchers, too. So I think it's important for all. Um, it's out there in the medical literature that uh, genetic testing is medically indicated and is a necessity in the workup of the child for autism. So if an insurance company de denies it, you can fight that. It's a medical necessity. So it is, um, you know, something that uh, they're liable for if they deny it. And so that's why most insurance companies will cover uh, genetic testing for autism. Depending on what type of test that's used, it can be very expensive. The Fragile X DNA test is cheap. Uh, the FISH studies uh, with high-resolution chromosomes are more expensive, 
and the CGH array are the most expensive. And that last one that actually uh, demonstrates the subtle deletions and duplications, that is the one um, that may not be covered by some insurance companies. Uh, although that's starting to be covered more and more because it's a very valuable type of testing. And I, to answer about research studies, there are, you can go, is it the, the Ian one is, it's not Ian, it's Isaac, right? Or not Isaac, it's Ian. <laughs> I think there's an Ian website that you go on, I-A-N, and that can tell you about research studies available in your area that you might be involved in. A lot of researchers in autism put their studies up there as kind of like a flyer or an advertisement um, for involvement. I, I've consulted on genetic studies, and one of the things that you should be aware of is it might not be the genetic test that you're looking for. So if you want a specific type of testing, you, you, know, you need to know enough about genetics to know what they're looking at. Another thing is it's not like going to the clinic. You know, Your blood gets sent, but who knows when you're going to get the results back. It's not pressing because it's for research, not for clinic treatment. Um, and a lot of the families I know have called us back for our study saying what were the results and we, we don't always, we aren't always able to give those results. So you should ask questions as part of research studies like will I find out if there is something abnormal? Um, how will I find out? When will I find out? Are you doing testing that will enable me to see Fragile X, etc.? Yeah, and um, our Fragile X testing that we do in all of our studies um, is always covered, so we do, we look, not only look at CGG repeat, but we look at messenger RNA levels and protein levels and X activation ratios, so we look very carefully at the Fragile X machine and it's always covered in our research. I have a, I have a question regarding medications, if Dr. Dr. Hogman wouldn't mind addressing. Uh, my young adult son um, is, uh, he has tried a, a few different medications through the course of his um, 20 plus years and he's, and he's had adverse side effects. And when I bring up um, Abilify to uh, two different uh, physicians thus far, they don't, they're not comfortable with it and don't want to pursue that angle. And what my son has tried in the past is a stimulant drug like the Ritalin and then the SSRI. He's had some adverse effects as emotional outbursts and, and irritability, so and then we've, we've backed off. And now he's trying, we're trying the guanfacine, just a low dose. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only been a month, and um, seeing, we're not quite sure yet if we're seeing positive effects. But I walked in, just as you're introducing yourself and talking a little bit about some of the background medications that have found to be efficacious. Would you mind addressing? Sure. Those? I also have a paper out in January of pediatrics. Uh, so if your physician wants to read about the latest medications, uh, the January issue in pediatrics has an article about advances in Fragile X treatment. So it goes over all of the research done on a variety of medications. I think Abilify is basically the best medication out there for Fragile X, and that may be true for some subgroups of autism too, um, but Abilify um, has some remarkable effects. Um, you know, I think if you have a physician that's uncomfortable with Abilify, you know, you could probably go to a specialist that is comfortable with Abilify. You have to go with very low doses because Sometimes uh, if you give too high of a dose of Abilify, like for adult, I would start with, you know, five milligrams. And if they have agitation, that means you always cut the dose in half. And so there's a lot of individuals, you know, that are just on one or two milligrams of Abilify. And it, it really has some great effects about improving attention and concentration because it enhances dopamine frontally decreases anxiety, but it's a great mood stabilizer. Um, it's kind of a new version of Risperdal or Risperidone, and Risperidone has been shown to be very efficacious in autism. I mean, this came out in New England Journal of Medicine in 2002, uh, that uh, Risperidone was helpful for 68% of individuals with autism in terms of 
of decreasing a lot of negative behaviors uh, like aggression or outbursts, improving hyperactivity, making a big difference in terms of some of the repetitive behaviors. Um, and um, I think that's very helpful too. I think it's very exciting about what serotonin agents can do to improve language and socialization. So these are core features of autism. And I think a young kid with autism who particularly has a low language or um, has uh, you know, obsessive compulsive behavior, which SSRIs do a lot for, I mean, I think that kid should definitely be tried on um, an SSRI. And there are big multi-center studies going on now. There's a variety of different studies that have demonstrated uh, efficacy with SSRIs and autism and even in preschoolers. So, I mean, I think um, that these drugs can be quite helpful uh, early on. And of course, whenever we're talking about medication, we're also always talking about multimodality interventions. So all of the stuff that Amy talked about are critically important, but I think you also have to get the medical input to really understand the specific etiology of autism through uh, genetic testing and also have the advantage of trying some psychopharmacological interventions. And that's even more true of targeted treatments. You know, should your adult try minocycline? Good idea. I had a... I had a question about uh, the, your report on the uh, evidence base for behavioral treatments. Uh, you, you said that the evidence showed that 25 hours a week was, was uh, uh, sort of the minimal, I don't know, minimal, optimal, a required level of dosage. What I wasn't clear about is that 25 hours provided by professionals or is that 25 hours of certain types of activities regardless whether it's parents or professionals? That's a really good question, and we don't, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. There have been, the, the 25 hours a week really came from, um, you know, what is a full school day? So that's where they kind of started from. And then there were, there were some studies demonstrating research support or evidence uh, that once you hit 25 hours or more than that, you see um, significant, you know, effect sizes or gains in skills for kids. But if it's less than that, you know, 10 to 20, you don't see as much or you don't see any. So um, that kind of came out of also a lot of these programs say you have to have 40 hours a week of um, therapy before you see effects. Well, really the research doesn't support that, or, you know, 25 to 40 is kind of equivalent, but you do have to get to a certain level. Now, there have been studies that have looked at parent-implemented therapies like doing ABA uh, as opposed to, you know, a UCLA-trained professional, um, and there's, there's always a little bit of drift, and it seems like less efficacy when you compare community-implemented interventions to ones that are done under highly controlled conditions. But what you have to sort of remember is these are kind of different populations. So the ones who get to UCLA, by the way, Jenny McCarthy's child, those are sort of the more um, educated, uh, they have a little bit more resources to take the child to that highly controlled environment. And it's just different when you're covering everyone. So um, I think, you know, the, these are basic guidelines and we need to do the research to know for whom these interventions work and what the sort of dosage is for each kid. Certainly parents and community people who aren't PhDs in autism can do these interventions and show treatment gains for the kids. This question is for Amy and uh, could you clarify Weatherby's program, spell it for me, and compare it just briefly with Dawson and Rogers? Um, okay. So Say that first part again. How, what is Weatherby's program oh, Weatherby. called? And then how does it, do those two new programs compare, just briefly? Sure. So Amy Weatherby's program is called Early Social Interaction, ESI. You can find out a little bit about that um, on the Florida State University website or Google Amy Weatherby. Um, it's also, there's also a study on that going on at the University of Michigan. Um, so that's their replication site. 
these are, that's a brand new treatment. There isn't, um, you know, recently got funded to have a multi-site uh, study to see if it's working outside of the initial kids who got the intervention. Um, the difference between that and Sally Rogers, Jerry Dawson's early start uh, Denver model is um, I think the intensity is different. So, and this, let me just tell you, this comes from talking with Kathy Lord, so this isn't in any research. Kathy Lord's group is implementing both interventions at um, the University of Michigan Autism Program. So the Denver model has, you know, more kind of instructional, scripted emphasis on things like imitation um, and, and skills like joint attention, whereas the early social interaction interventions um, look more like uh, incorporating communication strategies within what you're already doing. So um, I know that they ask parents to identify one daily routine, like giving your child a bath or eating or getting dressed and working in some strategies to get more spon spontaneous communication at those times. And you also do um, like a set aside play time with your child uh, where you're sort of tutored by uh, a consultant who helps you build that play interaction. And so also these, these therapies kind of have different purposes. So early start Denver model is really for kids who are diagnosed already. So like right after they get diagnosed, they're two, they're three. The early social intervention model might be more geared toward kids who are showing, showing some signs or they might be at risk because their baby sibs but they don't have the full diagnosis yet. Um, so I don't think we know like which kid would do better from which intervention or how those two compare to one another. But um, hopefully that information will be coming soon. There are studies funded to look at those things. I'm getting the sign that we've run out of time, so I want to thank our distinguished speakers uh, for a very interesting afternoon or morning. Thank our attendees uh, for, for being here.